A word to the wise. We are an explicit podcast tackling con... Wait, this isn't my script. This week on Fade to Obsidian, they are discussing chapters 46 through 50 of Lightbringer. They recommend that you have read up until this point in the book. Please note that there will be discussions of violence, torture, death, and use of strong language. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome, everybody, to Fade to Obsidian. I'm Skipper, joined, as always, by Crescent, and joined, I think now you are officially the second most frequent guest after Salem. Welcome back, yep, Badger. I'm certain that's true. Hello, hello. Thanks for this joining is, us again. Yeah, you're always a pleasure. Fourth episode. Everybody knows I what think. that means. It might also be, it might be my fifth. Is fifth? It's fourth or fifth. I'm not sure yeah. which one. It's I yeah. mean, two for Lightbringer. Yeah. Salem hasn't even been on been on twice for Lightbringer. Look at you go. <laughs> well, maybe this is my my treat because I was the first one in the den to finish it. I think I think it was like me and one other person like neck and neck. Yeah, because you stayed uh, up the... all night and like yeah, you coasted yep. through for like the full... got up early, stayed up all night. And went for it, full yeah. bore. I love it. I love it. Yep. How does that compare to now the reread? It was, well, the whole reason I did that is because I wanted to have like an immersive experience. And the reread has not been that. And so um, it's felt digestible in a different way. Yeah. Um, would probably be the biggest difference between the two, but the parts that hit still really hit. So it holds up, of course. Nice. Nice. Yep. nice. Well, welcome back. Yeah, means trauma or at least some Ish. psychological issues. I feel like this time we're upping the ante from the last one a little bit. I've got, I've definitely, yeah, there's a lot <laughs> in these chapters. So, yeah, yeah. yeah there is. Yeah. Well, what are you drinking tonight or today? It's actually 3 p.m. This is one of the earliest recording sessions we've ever done. Well, yeah. we needed to make sure that there was space for it. Um, yeah. uh, Woodford Reserve Double Oak. It is very good, honestly. It's warm. It's warm and very tasty. Lots of notes upon drinking. Yeah. Surprisingly delicious every time. Nice. Crescent, what do you have? Uh, <clears throat> I got a couple different ones tonight. Uh, I'm trying to catch up on my beer advent calendar. Mm. So <clears throat> I found two that actually fit. I've got Rabble Rouser Red. Nice. For Lyria. Um, and then this one I, I like less, but still also fits. Uh, Destiny IPA. Mm. Nice. I have, um, it's an Earl Grey cocktail, so it's basically Earl Grey. Nice. Couple of It's other, a martini. Uh, yeah, with gin. So it gets both Fa and his, like, gentlemanly tea-drinking ways, and I threw gin in instead of, it gave you a couple options of rum, um, vodka. Well, you could probably put any spirit into it, but the gin works really well uh just for cassius because it is specifically called out that there is alpine on his breath and daryl yep. curses about how many different kinds of alcohol he has on the ship so i had to go gin for him um yeah so perfect that's it yeah uh badger i just woke up from a nap and there is something happening in the den what what is what is this? What is this like very brief message I saw? Okay, so last time we talked about the gym rat war mm -hmm. and that being a very extensive and holistic physical challenge that we did over the course of a month. Um, and in that process, we kind of created Gym Rat Legion. 
Um, but seasons change and we're no longer in fall. And I've been thinking about how to structure these types of challenges or challenges in general in the den so that they there's an ebb and a flow and some mm, breathability to them. Because not everything can be such a big effort. And I wanted to do something for January. So what I've created is called A Path to the Veil. And the purpose of the pa A Path to the Veil would be to become an observer. Much like we're past, we just passed this part. So if you think about Darrow on the way out to the rim and he's getting his, he's getting his body back and he's getting his mind right. And he's integrating all the learning that he's done by writing um, to Pax. And, and that is the mind body connection that he's been missing overall. So we're going to get good at observing where we are, doing little activities, seeing how those things affect and then making notes about it and then doing that over and over um, over the course of the month. And we'll have four different categories, environment, body, mind, spirit, and soul. So that will include everything from rearranging a room in your house, getting rid of clutter, um, taking something to donate up to, you know, meditation and things like that. And there'll be like a daily journal prompt that goes along with it. And uh, again, it's really customizable. You can check it out if you hop in the den. I'll be posting stuff on my social media at some point, but it's it's meant to be really accessible and less focused on physical, although there is a physical component. Very cool. I like that. I like yeah. that a lot. That's awesome. Yeah. Thanks, man. Yeah. You're always so good about bringing in what you do best, but your background is, as well as to a community and get it bringing everyone together. So I'm super excited to see how the den takes this one on as well. There's already 17 people signed up and it dropped like an hour ago. So I'm pretty, pretty pumped. Yeah. <laughs> napping an hour ago. <laughs> yeah. Nice. That's awesome. I love that. Yeah. Den's always, always down for, um, stuff. fun. <laughs> yeah. Fun, yeah. fun stuff. Fun and stuff and chaos. And the thing, of course, is the trade-off is there's always going to be swag. But also, you know, I think, I feel like, I bring it back, we talked, touched on this the last time we talked about the gym rat war, is that live for more quality that that is throughout the books that drives all of our mains and even actually the antagonists, even though why they're living for more we don't really like <laughs> but you know there's a lot of people of ideals that exist yeah. in these books and i think that it, uh, people are inspired and it's fun to help guide that inspiration into healthy um progressive sort of self-progressive um outlets yeah yeah for sure be badasses together yes love it so good Hell yeah. uh, speaking of badasses, the two of you are currently doing the Howler Project uh, challenge of December, which is cold water. It <laughs> Trial is of ice. ice. Cold water. Trial of yes. ice. Yeah. yeah. Shout out Jinx. Thank you, Jinx. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I needed the... Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. I needed the push. I keep trying to do it on my own. Just being like, I'm going to incorporate cold water. And then every time I'm like, mm, that is really spicy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's severely uncomfortable. I'm not yeah. going to do that. <laughs> yeah. For sure. Well, the ongoing yeah. joke is like, I only jump, I'll jump in like a giant body of water when it's freezing cold. But I, kudos to you guys who are like standing in the shower. Like, absolutely not. I want to be in and out once a month. <laughs> and that's it. Preferably in like an ocean, not even my sister has a cold plunge and I'm like, absolutely not. Am I doing that? So kudos to both of you guys and everyone else doing it. Do you have a plunge or do you do shower mostly crescent? Oh, I only have a shower. Yeah. It's just I, my, my water uh, comes through frozen ground. Yeah. And then yeah. out of the shower head. So yeah. it comes out at like 50 degrees. Yeah. Yeah. I use the um, industrial 
piping from the YMCA. And by the time it gets to me, it's very, very, very cold. Uh, and uh, I don't know what your method is, but I just stand there and I go like that. And I try to breathe out a whole lot slowly. Yeah. But yep. of course, I, bas- I basically stand like a, uh... Like you're in prison, getting hosed down with a fire hose. <laughs> <laughs> I stand with my hands against the wall and just let the <laughs> let the water come down over my head and shoulders and and chest, and basically yeah. do the same thing. Yeah. Just try and focus on my breathing, because wow. otherwise it gets all hitchy and. <laughs> yeah, a week in, <laughs> I feel like I have more control of yeah, the exhales. Nice. Yeah. Nice. No, I, what, well, last January plunged myself into Ant- uh, Antarctica. That's how, that's how dramatic I'm going to be. Uh, the Atlantic <laughs> Ocean in Halifax. So it was half frozen over. Uh, and like for an ocean to freeze is something. Uh, and the one thing I remember is like, first off, it, we couldn't get deep enough. So you had to lie down. You were only in mm-hmm. a foot of water. But then, like, breathing was the thing for, like, 15 minutes later. I was like, I still can't catch my breath. Like, I That's the dream, breath. though. I follow Cold Plunge Cam. I don't know if y'all follow him. But, um, you know, he's often out in frozen bodies of water in where, wherever he happens to be. I forget. But, um, like, I wish. I mean, this is, like, the one, one reason I wish I was in a very cold environment just go out into nature and do that yeah yeah the only the only problem with that is getting back out is not always as easy as getting in yeah yeah well and that was my thing with when i did it it was my friend who lived in the area and had done it before wore flip-flops did not tell me to wear flip-flops so i actually think i was more concentrated on how much the stones hurt my feet than the actual cold mm. water. And then you're trying to get out and across like rocks. And it was like, and then have to run to the car. Like it was a whole, a whole thing. But yeah, I've, rather I've done it also in like up in Muskoka and like Sandy beach, way better, way better. Although more mm. people watching, which is awkward, but yeah. Anyway, kudos to you guys and everyone else doing it. There's a whole group of you doing it, which is a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. I don't know how many people are are actually signed up, but... Yeah, because... I think Jinx has a pretty... Or... Yes. Yeah. And I think he has a pretty dedicated group of people that participate in his challenges. Yeah, from outside mm-hmm. the Yeah. Uh, well, everybody join the den. You can join Path to the Veil. Vale. You can check out at, what is it? Trial of the it? Ice. Trial of the Ice. Uh, for that one, it is in Howler Project, which is, we have so many channels, but it is actually in Carver Station, which is where Fade to Obsidian lives. It's kind of where all the yep. pet projects It's actually are. the next channel below Fade to Obsidian. Oh, there you go. There you go. We're, we're neighbors. <laughs> we're neighbors. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just trying to live up to my my birthright. Yeah, it's true. You and you and the basic tundra over there. Yeah, but yeah. Well, and then it's I actually been pretty about... nice so far this year. It's it was raining really on Thursday. Warm. It was raining here it was, today. It was raining, uh, and there is no snow here. Oh, look at you go! Yeah, huh. it's I think it's supposed to, to snow a bunch this week though. It's supposed to be a warm winter. Hmm. An El Nino winter, does that affect you guys up where you are? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if it would affect Crescent because it's all about the Atlantic it, it, Ocean. So it might it will, push but over. Less. But yeah. yeah. It's still going to be cold here, but yeah. less yeah. cold. Always. Yeah, exactly. Say, so, uh, talk about the den just to give them a shout out as I noticed while we were piling in here that Cavix's more magical world, they are playing D and D today. So there's another thing for the den. I feel like we just need to slowly like create a calendar and, uh, highlight one thing a week because there's so much happening in the den and people don't even yeah. know that they, they join and they're like, uh, Oh, there's someone who just joined and they've only been reading golden sun and they're like, 
you guys have so many channels. It's just such an active server. It doesn't even matter that I haven't read the whole book. And we're like, exactly. Like, come on in, everybody. Yeah. Well, and then tomorrow, as of recording, we have a Hobbit Marathon. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, Hobbit tomorrow. trilogy. Yeah, I won't be there. Um, I can't support it. And the then, <laughs> and then the next, next Sunday after this is airing. So if you're watching this next Sunday is the full Lord of the Rings extended, extended edition because there is no other edition. Um, what time are they starting? The it was a whole... Like 4.23 Pacific time. Yeah, it was a whole debate on whether or not we were going to actually make California wake up at 4 a.m. And we were like, absolutely, that's the only way to yeah. get through. Because we actually yeah. had to make it... There was a whole thing of do we plan for we need everybody to be in limber legion which would be the perfect like if we can end it and then everyone do some yoga because you've been sitting on the couch for so long or yep. do you put limber legion in the dead <laughs> center so everybody is forced to pause like it was a whole debate in pegasus legion of when do we start and then at the end we're like oh no sorry california you are starting at 4 a.m <laughs> yeah we can also do five minute you know, stretch breaks in between each I, I feel movie. like that's going to be needed. Yeah. Yeah. But that's Limber Legion. I do, Den, for those of you who are just tuning in and don't know this. And actually, a lot of the people in the Den are newish. And always there's always a revolving um, cast of new howlers. So if you are new or if you are finding this podcast and don't know yet about the Den, I um, do a, I lead a Zoom yoga sundays 7 p.m eastern very accessible feel free to join as a member of the den you only get access to the link in the den uh so there's that yeah yeah so much there's something for everybody there really is something there truly is uh kudos to those who just finished nanorimo i loved seeing all of them doing that in the den i don't even yeah. know i can't even call everybody <clears throat> There's just so much. We got we got some absolutely unreal numbers. Um, who was it? I think Allegro uh, wrote like fifty five thousand words. Yep. Nice. And I think Light did pretty close to that as well. And Viscera, they were all like fifty yep. plus. Mm -hmm. That's insane. Yeah. Yeah. Good That's for so you guys. Cool. Yeah, I love that. I love that. All right, well, shall we get into this week's chapters, get into the trauma before we all finish the first drinks? Um, it mm -hmm. is chapters 46 to 50, which is some meaty, meaty chapters. Uh, and it is just Darrow and Lysander's point of views. So we are going to break it up. We discussed this before. We're going to break it up so that it's Lysander first we can get into some get him out of the way get him out of the way but like also it's really like there's a oh there's definitely a lot of stuff in so this chapter much. but, but <clears throat> he is what was we said this during i think iron gold that lysander he's a window is, to the more interesting characters exactly and so we're gonna get atlas we're gonna get Tha. Um, we're, we get Roan's point of view. Uh, yeah, Roan's point yeah, of view. Yeah, we get a little bit of background on Roan. Uh, so there's really interesting other characters that we're getting via Lysander. And I think this is one of, since Iron, like, in Iron Gold, it didn't feel like Lysander was in control of his life. Cassius was in control of Lysander's life. Dark Age in the beginning of Lightbringer. Lysander kind of takes that back, but we're back of like <laughs> Lysander is just not anymore. Yep, <laughs> he is just a poor boy who uh, everybody is going to <laughs> like work around. Um, but yeah, and then uh, we'll follow up after with our favorite crew of misfits, and and they've got a whole bunch of stuff to work through literally physically at one point in this uh but definitely yep. mentally as well well physically because of the mentally i would say but uh yeah it's manifesting so, exactly uh so let's dive in with 
Lysander waking up after learning that, you know, he is now. You just said he's a poor boy, and now I can't not track him <laughs> a little bit with um, Bohemian Rhapsody. I know, even as I was thinking, I was thinking Bohemian Rhapsody. Well, he's not from a poor family, but no, but he's spare, like, spare yeah, it kind of breaks life. down in the first line. <laughs> yeah, uh, yes, spare <laughs> his life from this monstrosity. In his mind, he fits exactly into that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, he's, he's waking up and he's, uh, well, he wakes up to Roan, right? Like, that's a, the immediate what we get. Is that correct? Or is there something before that? Mm hmm. Which is yeah. coming right. I mean, starting with him here works well because of where his POV leaves off kind of high stakes moment. Yeah very much divested of any agency at the hands of Atlas and his ilk. Yeah. Um, the Greys have until now felt amorphous in a, in a, um, in an interesting, like we talked about last time with Rat Legion in a, way that leaves space to be interesting and cultivate the imagination. So now we get into Roan's backstory and it is fascinating to me. I um, have a lot of respect for Roan. I have had a lot of respect for Roan as a character, a supporting character, even though he's on the wrong side of things. Um, and here we find he's on the wrong side of things a couple times ever. Mm -hmm. But as a foil to like Holiday, I find him very interesting. Like the gray foil to Holiday. Yeah. That's a good call out. Yeah, yeah exactly I... as loyal, but for worse reasons. Mm -hmm. For sure. But having at this point, we found out loss on both sides, Holiday obviously with Trig, um, and then he's got, I didn't do the math, but starts with 100, they lose, I think, 46 or 64, I forget if it's one way or the other, down to 12, like massive loss of what they call the kennel. And mm -hmm. they're then, you know, how each of them takes out, that out of holiday then fully devotes herself to the cause for it seems like the greater good we don't really ever get holiday's take on why she's doing it but we can infer that rather than roan like very much still has a selfishness to it if you want to call it that but within reason like you've lost that much uh, and wants vengeance comes with all of this with a hatred of the raw because you're who caused it. And um, so a very interesting point of view of that, of why. And I, I would say understandable. I mean, not excusable, but understandable, uh, which is very interesting. The so there's opportunities here and there. Rat Legion, like we talked about last time, is one of them where we get to see other colors in somewhat ascendant roles and qualities in a world that is otherwise made for gold. Also, sometimes you can see that with the blues. Um, and you can see that with the Reds and the Drakenjägers. But here, the anecdote that all 100 of his century um, made it were elite enough to be selected for the Praetorian Guard um, was... I mean, it's, it's written to be impressive. That's impressive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, because he originally says, like, you know, a typical kennel would have maybe five go to the guard. Yeah. Like, Mm -hmm. that's wild. Mm Mm-hmm. Never happened before, and it will never happen again. Yeah. Yeah. And of that, only Marcus and Drusilla and he are left. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, like, in theory... Even though, of course, those Ludus relationships would be always significant to some degree because of the shared experience. Um, So the Greys would have that kind of camaraderie when they come into contact with each other, regardless of where they then go on. But that shared experience continued for decades before they they started to get picked off. And so, yeah, I mean... It's vengeance, not not the prettiest of human motivations, but certainly a very understandable one. Yep. Yep. The um, Rowan's century is the Canadians. The... A whole bunch of people that knew each other really well oh, got thrown into war. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then you do crazy things when it is your childhood best friend who is being killed yep it's where the war crimes happen for sure yep Yep. yeah definitely i was just thinking you use the word vengeance looking at this because we know the other person who's out for vengeance is victra and how us as the reader you know look at victra and go hells yeah get it and then look at roan and kind of our immediate thing is like oh you did that, like you sided with, and just that little bit, um, which I think gets back to, we had the discussion with Philip from Hale Reaper of reading as a howler versus a removed person, like as an observer. And I think for me, just as we are reflecting in this moment, I think that's that's a moment that it's, Victra, I want to get vengeance. Roan, actually, I won't lie. I'm kind of happy because in my mind, this fucks up everything for the golds, right? Like Lysander is now screwed. We can dig into that later when we learn Atlas's full plan. But either way, I think we look at this and go, Roan, what have you done? And why is that? Why is our reaction different? Is it because we've known Victor for so long and seen her pain versus Roan, we're just hearing about it now? I find a lot of latitude for myself in everybody but Lysander. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and like the grimaces. The grimaces yeah, also can kind of fuck yeah. off. Except for um OG Aja. Grimace. Aja. She yeah. she gets yeah, a pass. Right. But um when it comes to Roan and Tha and Atlas they, their motivations, their viewpoints and ideals as a counterpoint or maybe balance point or to Lysander and Atalantia's, um, I find them fascinating. And we'll get into that in a second more because I have a lot to say as Atlas reveals his plans and his motivations. But um, Brown kind of gets a pass for me here. And yeah, in I can particularly like appreciate and have what schaden i don't know let's say a proper schadenfreude. schadenfreude or is it schadenfreude duh is oh, there a, uh, at the we'll end have, we'll have to ask one of our german dollars <laughs> truck and help <laughs> carbon and get help. Out. yeah yep. <laughs> um anyways uh at, at the fact that lysander got poisoned by him <laughs> and he took kyber out of play which I find actually interesting too. Like, you know, again, Pierce uses the Chekhov's gun philosophy very liberally where he will put something into play. It might not be significant in the moment, but normally it will come back around and be, it was very intentional. So Kyber being noted as like, Kyber is not one of them. Kyber is super badass and scary. Kyber got taken out by one of them. You know, I feel like 
that is going, she, she will probably factor in. That's my guess is that she will factor in more significantly later on. Yeah. And I'm not looking forward to it. She'll be out for vengeance. Yeah. Great. Yep. Great. But also you say that check out Lake, the, of when we oh, learn. Oh, I can't, I can't even say that. No, no, no. You stop. No, we're good. Um, I, uh, I checked myself already. I'm not going to wreck nothing. Um, the wolf cloak, or not the wolf cloak. I just in my head. Yeah. Instinctually think everything is a wolf cloak. The cloak uh, that, you know, is given to the red and then given back. And it's noted at that point how weak the red is handing back because the poison would have been on the cloak and given... Like, if, if it's taking that long for, or not even that long, it doesn't take that long for a gold to hit, you know that the red's DNA is not holding it. So, you know, he probably passed away moments after that. And huh. so even that, you know, Pierce, Pierce revealing the cloak ceremony, if you will, and how it's returned of, you know, this red looks feeble kind of a thing. Like that alone is Pierce is always yeah. five steps ahead of us that the rest of us probably yeah, went, definitely. okay, there's so many ceremonies happening in here. Why do I care about that? And then you discover that that's actually very essential. Yeah. Well, and then like definitely in the moment you're like, ah, uh, yeah, typical Lysander looks at the red and is like, oh yes, he's sickly and frail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Not seeing and, foreshadowing. No, not seeing foreshadowing, not thinking of like, can I take care of you? Like, go, have you seen the medic? Lysander's like, okay, hey, great, thanks, bye. Rather than if it was, I feel like, on the side of the Republic, even if, you know, that cloak was given to Mustang, she would probably make some comment about like, or like, I, if it's her POV, I feel like we'd get something along the lines. If I ensure a yellow follows up, right? Like, it's just yeah. that, like, yeah. he looks sickly pale. I also feel like Mustang would leave the cloak with him. Like, you've earned true. it, buddy. You've you earned it. You keep it's it. It's yours now. Yeah. Yeah, that mm -hmm. is very true. Wouldn't take it back. Yeah. So it kind of reeks of a whole bunch of Lysander's downfall and stupidity of things. It's great. It's great. We love it. I'm feeling a moment right now as we're we're dissecting this particular piece and also this that whole scene was in the segment that we did last time. I just feel like we're getting really good at uh analyzing Pierce's writing style. <laughs> <laughs> We've got your number, man. We're yeah. on to you. <laughs> Pierce, is that a reference? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I think I'm going to release on Christmas Eve is I'm going to go through and uh, release everything as a Christmas present to everyone. Every time we say, is that a reference? <laughs> Just go through all <laughs> Oh, the that's things. a monumental undertaking. I know. We'll see. I keep saying I'm going to do all the bottle licks and I haven't done it. So nobody, nobody hold me to anything. But the bottle licks would be harder. You can at least analyze the yeah. dialogue with AI these days. It, you can. I know of one of our fellow podcasts that uses a thing that takes out every uh what one two three clap so that they can start and end so uh 100 i could just run it through and find every time we go is that a reference mm -hmm. but uh yeah mm -hmm. and as you say we're getting we're on to you pierce i like so then they so they take, um, Roan takes Lysander back to Atlas, and on the way, they're talking about the ship and how it's off of the books, entirely off of the books. The leaf and the sticks, you know, everybody thought that he was going to be on the sticks, but really he's on this other ship that nobody even knows about. Mm -hmm. the, is, the man is mysterious in so many ways. Yeah. I kind of have a villainous crush on Atlas at this point. 
He's a it's absolutely. all the Raws, man. All the yeah. Raws are daddy. Raws. He's evil daddy. He's, he's so evil daddy. daddy. Yeah, he's he's daddy with twirly mustache. <laughs> he's a genius. That like I just want to dissect his mind and like I know it probably has psychopathic tendencies and I don't know well, they say that psychopaths are very charming a lot of the time and like you look at Ted Bundy and a few of those and like that's what this is giving me of like you would be the person at a party that I wanna just sit and talk to. Like just the mastermind. And playing everybody of Atlantia, his own family, Fa, like how many different, all kind of a, so like against Octavia. And I like that Lysander notes at one point of he wouldn't be, I forget if it's he either wouldn't be telling me or he wouldn't like have me roaming around if I could do anything about it. Because Atlas is mm-hmm. like, nah, bud, like you're fucked. You're here. You're yeah, stuck. There, with, you're the, gonna do whatever I want. You're done. Right. There, there is no, there's no monologue where you can somehow manage to wiggle out of it. Yeah. Like Lysander talks about, you know, he's been he basically he's been playing 4D chess for twelve years. Yeah. Why did it just pop up a th- a <laughs> bubble thumb? <laughs> this is- what new. the fuck? <laughs> it's wild. What if I do this? What if I do this? Anybody? Is this no? is this the new Discord app? I don't know. Oh my god, this is so funny. No, I don't think it works for me. I wonder it's if that's just on, just on, on my. It's my. I think it's my. I've enabled it on my iPhone, oh, and okay. it transcends every single video. This is great. Whack. I know. <laughs> Um, wait, wait, there was one. Can I do this? No? I thought I did this the other day and I, it went, it made it hard. Anyways. Um, so I think I said this last time referencing the blue wig scene and there was another reference in Dark Age 2 with Atlas that really gave me Hannibal Lecter vibes. But now we're getting into him like lit or Buffalo Buffalo Bill slash Hannibal Lecter slash Moriarty. Like I feel like he's a mashup of all of these like really mastermindy type. Yeah, uh well Buffalo, Buffalo, Buffalo Bill's Bill. not really mastermind, but you know, anyways. Creepy. I yeah, and now we creepy. now we literally have him wearing uh, somebody else's skin. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So him. Yeah. Oh, I didn't even make that connection of like the skin suit in Hannibal Lecter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and can we talk he... about how at the beginning of this, Helios is still alive. They are keeping him alive yeah. in case they need him for something. And then. Yeah, they're, they're literally killed. jacked into his brain. Yeah. Yeah. It's, like, it's um unsavory. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Very unsavory. Um, yes, I have a note. It says, damn, Helios was alive that whole time. Yeah. And just kind of like chilling in the bed next to them until like, nope. And like... A wreck. Atlas's yeah. arms are just like in a fish tank. <laughs> like... Yep. They're just floating. Yeah, he's got a stub. Stub for an arm. Yeah. Both um, of them. Yeah. 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 So yeah, what, what are so we much happening. like here? Yeah, that's about what I was imagining. Is, it, is he is he this one armed or is it the other arm? <laughs> <laughs> Tell me when to stop. <laughs> nah, it's the other arm. <gasps> it's the other arm. <laughs> Everybody go on. I don't even know what episode of Community that one's in. It says from the mm-hmm. elbows down. Yeah, elbows season down. three, episode eighteen. Look at him go. It's the riot episode. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Greendale Riot episode. Um, yeah. Yeah, so elbows down. That would make sense because I feel like it's so much harder yeah, he to needed, connect he needed the how forearm. many tissues. Yeah. In the SESTA, yeah. yeah. Um, up until this point, I was a little bit, the, the, the first read-through, I was a little bit unsure whether, like, I knew Atlas and Fa had a relationship and it felt to me as though... Atlas was seemed like okay. Atlas is pulling the strings here. I think we've pieced all of that together. Um, but 
specifically, I noted that, okay, this is where it becomes very clear that when they're referring to the All Father, it's Atlas. Yeah. It's oh, yeah. not amorphous. It's not Fat Fa's, not the All Father. It is, Atlas is a godlike figure to this new order of obsidian slash Askamani warriors that they've created, the Volk, yeah. etc. For sure. Yeah, very interesting. Um, I mean, I'm, to say even that, like, yes, yeah, so he's playing the job of a god, but he's doing it so well and creating a world and a society amongst them that he basically is a god. Like, if you think of, you know, quintessential, let's, Zeus or, you know, even Christian uh, Judaism god of like that creationist kind of that mentality. He has created for them these lives. He has created for them everything that they can go forth and do. He's pulling the strings in these behavioralist things that you look at mythology and what he is able to accomplish is on the level of different myths and legends like he is be basically being their god he just happens to be a mortal one he as an as a single person has more effectively pulled that off pulled that wool over the obsidian's head than the entire gold society did as we saw in uh the original, uh, yeah, gold, yeah. no, uh, Morningstar, Morningstar, when they go, when they go to visit yeah. uh, the Obsidians. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very fascinating. Uh, and how thought through his plan is, but I really like where it came from. And especially Lysander calls out of, like, you hate your family this much. And he's like, this is not personal. Like, this is so above all that. And where the plan came from and why it needs to be executed in the way that it does is very interesting to me. Um, there is, I would say, a little bit, use the word vengeance, uh, against Octavia of you sent me away, you sent where we can't, I would love to know the amount of times they say that you can't see the sun. Because that seems to be a reoccurring oh, yeah. theme in all of this. <clears throat> of in the rim, you can't, well, it's not even like he's past that, but you can't see the sun. Uh, and so that little bit, I, that's got to get to you. You're lacking that vitamin D so badly. Um, we know that's where you people know, make bad choices when they're that deficient in vitamin D. Listen, we mm -hmm. live in Canada and you're supposed to have special vitamin D lamps. Never mind if you're out like past the rim. Like, yeah, you got to get that vitamin D. But it's very thought, thought through every link and, you know, to the point of there is a Lysander doppelganger because... There, you know, Atalantia sees it as needing her paramour, as you will, uh, needs Lysander in that capacity. But Atlas knows that it should not be Atlantia on the uh, morning chair. It should be Lysander, but he needs a Lysander he can control. Uh, and it just, I don't know, the whole thing is just... Fascinating. This whole chapter is actually just... Okay, so from that point that you start at where he's asked, hey, you think this is personal? You think some petty vengeance repayment for, you know, and then he goes on and he whacks really poetic about <laughs> his family right there in a very poignant way. And then go, so you see all of a sudden he's, you know, a sociopath doesn't have that kind of connection with people. So then the that for me kind of dispels that because up until now I'm tracking with you. I'm thinking, okay, this man is like a kingmaker 
from the vantage point of wanting to manipulate for the sake of manipulating. But here we see the beginnings like, okay, that this flies in the face of that train of thought. Um, and then he goes on to talk about how much he believes in the society and um, that it is really stands the best chance for the betterment of humanity. Humankind. He talks about that term. Where is it? Autophagy, right? And when he starts talking about the autophagy, civilization is not a clever system. It is stupid and artificial, unsustainable project of man's hubris. <laughs> I mean, come on. He's not fucking wrong. I say these, these kinds of things all of the time. Like, where else in the natural order of things do do we fight against uh, attrition and turnover and change? Systems in nature don't stand for forever. They always eventually fall. Things get built back from the pieces. Nothing in the long term, nothing lasts for forever. Hubris is a huge theme in Dune and... Uh, this is where I feel like Atlas brings a lot of like Herbert Dune stuff yeah. into the dialogue here. And, um, and so this man truly believes, and I want to know why, why does he think that a, a society based system, a, a, a hierarchical color based system is the path forward? Yeah. What's yeah, it, his why? I don't know. He's too smart for me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I want to know why, though. I'm very curious. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I guess he's he's looking at maybe some of the inherent predispositions of humanity. And, and thinking, okay, well, gold has been created to um, mitigate those tendencies at a dispassionate remove. And that is the only way forward. But it's like, if that's the case, why isn't everybody gold? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. So, very, very interesting person. Probably a top favorite person for me in the whole series, despite the fact he's that he's an antagonist. Yeah, he I he feels at this point like the big baddie. Mm -hmm. Like you look at mm -hmm. all the villains, Atlantia and this like she's off fucking wherever, and you thought she was going to be the big baddie. That like yeah, Lysander's there. Um, abomination is kicking around who knows where but out there somewhere there's a couple other you know maybe playing their strings what is julia opalona's big plan who knows but i think like especially when dark age ends and the parts previous to this one you look at atlantia as the big baddie and this is the part that you're like oh it's atlas Atlas is the big baddie of this book. Like, he's the one who's actually pulling the strings and making Atlantia think it's her, getting the trust of all these other people. Though, I, I would love to know if Julia Albalona actually trusts in any capacity or if she's just for so long watched him from afar being like, the fuck is happening there? Or if he just flies I, under everybody's radar of like, oh, it's just at Atlantia's little, you know, what's the word? Minion. Yeah, I would venture to guess that very few people like actually trust Atlas. Okay. Yeah. Like, that seems like a, a very dangerous thing. If if he shared, I wonder how many people he's actually shared like his bigger picture with. Because again, you know, he goes on about the autophagy, but then and then there's like a interlude before he gets to the point of it all. And the point of it all is we can't be divided. 
which is, I guess um, that kind of goes into like dark forest theory. If you're not one of us, you're a threat kind of a thing. Too much, um, too many differences in culture and mm, identity will lead to ultimately um, war and uh, and or weakness and for humanity's sake there has to be a united front yeah. but I, I question that so you know in the sense that diversity is important again looking at nature so he's looking at nature in terms of Um, systems and failures of systems as the order of the day and and then what is interesting to me is like he almost contradicts himself because um, like monocrops monoliths of systems oftentimes are the weakest Mm -hmm. and most subject to catastrophic unpredictable failure black swan events um People want to read about that. Um, it's a scene, uh, Nicholas Nassim Taleb, really get great um, kind of theory of the um, of the tails on the distri- belt curve, the distribution, normal distribution system, like those not predictable events because they're so far outside of the norm, right? Like so, a united humanity where it's completely uh, homogenous between the inner planets and the rim would in theory be more susceptible to those black swan events which are the ones you can't plan for you can plan all around the center of the normal distribution but you can't plan for the shit on the sides and the only way to plan for the shit on the sides of the bell curve is to be diverse yeah interesting yeah. Interesting. Who has degrees in this shit? Somebody come and make yourself known and let's talk about it. <laughs> yeah. There are people who have degrees in these things. Come read this book and let us know what you think. <laughs> no yeah. Kidding. Yeah, we need some. We should do a whole like series after between Lightbringer and Red God of like, or even after Red God, depending on where we sit on all of this of like bring the expert on explain to us some of these so if you have a phd in anything or even masters or just bachelor or you just you know know a lot of sources hit us up and we will uh send that out this is a good moment to uh note that last week i started a google doc for anyone who wants to come on the show between lightbringer and red god and discuss any relationship Mm. or spaceship um so you can fill in there's already one that i won't say who or what it is but i read it at 3 a.m because that's when i wake up for work and it was so fascinating to me because it is a relationship between darrow and basically a mentality that he has Mm. i don't know maybe yep philosophy is the better word it's it's a good one i have i have heard what it is and uh it is it is a very good one yeah so um red wing oh red wing reach out to red wing if you want to like dive into how the uh red rising universe and the culture within the red rising universe either republic or society could future proof itself against uh, like black swan events and, and major c- catastrophes. Um, I know he has like ex- he has extensive disaster training, so um, yeah. he would be a really good really good person. I know he actually has read um, and uses that book that I was mentioning um, yeah. extensively in in his course work when he's studying stuff. So yeah, shout and out. He's mentioned Redding. coming, wanting to come on. He's one of our Patreons, so for sure. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, anyone who, if you're seeing this right now, 
And you have to join the den because I don't want the Google Doc going out into the <laughs> too far into the world universe. or else I feel like we're going to end up with some interesting things. Uh, but if you're in the den, you can find the Google Doc and let us know what topic you want to talk about between Lightbringer and Red God. Because, uh, yeah, there's some interesting things out there and this is this is the time to do it. Um, overanalyze and then you know when Red God comes back maybe we bring you back and we talk about how that all played out or you know if anything changes so um, yeah join the den uh, and uh, if you join our Patreon you do get priority of we will pick you over other people if because <laughs> I feel like everyone's going to be like I want to talk Darrow and Mustang first off that one is given to Salem don't go with that one but if you want to talk Severo in <laughs> Victra your best bet is to join the Patreon and you will be pushed up the line for that um, but yeah totally back on track here uh, what you're saying like the whole idea, the mentality of getting rid of the rim in order to control. And also, like, you look at what they've the rim has done in the last 12 years. If technically, how many times have they flipped sides? Like, they claim to be the definition of honor. And they do, like, they have to do what is right for themselves. But they're such a liability that the core should not trust them 100%. If it takes all it takes is, like, Daryl being like, hey... Look, I am in fact a red, but I can offer you this, and they flip, and the, like I get it why you would want the whole raw family eradicated, even though he is raw. Yeah. Do um, I find myself feeling this is the beginning of where I feel start to feel bad for Lysander? I won't okay. say how that progresses or doesn't progress over time. But I will say in this segment, I have a sense for Lysander. Cause we talked about, Oh, you know, Diomedes is his buddy. Like yeah. is one of, he's one of the few people that Lysander actually respects and wants approval from. And, um, and so, you know, I'm, at this point in my reading, I'm still thinking to myself, I hate the idea of a Lysander redemption arc very, very much, but wow, the lack of agency that he has had in his entire life feels really tragic. Yep. Maybe the one and only time that I feel like this is the beginning, the of me saying, okay, this, I can see the tragedy of this person's life that he thinks he's going to pick up a scalpel <laughs> against mm. Atlas. That's one of my you poor fool. Like <laughs> you think child, like with the butter I'm, knife. And then like, I'm honestly yeah. wondering if he could have done it. Atlas doesn't have hands. He nope. barely got yeah, eyes. Then what are you going to nope. do after that? You were on, like, I don't think Atlas is going to be the one who takes you down, but where do you go, bud? But what movie is that where the person steals the butter knife and then it Pirates of the Caribbean, Elizabeth Swan takes the butter knife. Oh. And this is what I'm picturing. Is this a reference, <laughs> Pierce? But she gets away with right? She's got that she's chasing Barbosa around the table and then stabs him, and that's when she discovers he's a skeleton and immortal. And like his co comment to her was like, What's your next move? Like, okay, so you killed the captain with a butter knife. Like, what is the next move? So you take down Atlas with a scalpel. You already know that Roan's not on your side. So what the fuck's your next move, bud? Which we do learn that he does not put the scalpel back down. I say, yeah. like, no, I will be keeping the scalpel. Thank you very much. It's like his safety blanket. Yeah. 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 He also, for the second time, I think there's a, um, I think it's in Dark Age. It could be earlier in this book, but I think at one another point in time. No, I think it is in Dark Age when he gets brought into Atlas and he yeah, talks about geez. Gaia, right? He, he talks about Gaia there and he tries to like, because I, I have a theory that he's got like 
major mm. mom, mommy issues. And there's a couple, like, there's several points where he either acts like somebody his, is his mother, like Mustang, or uh, latches on to a mother bond with somebody else. One of, an example of that would be Hit Gaia and um, and Atlas. Yeah. And this is the second time he tries to, like, use Gaia as, like, a wedge or some leverage point, a uh, psychological book leverage point with Atlas and Atlas. is like, no. No. So between yeah, that, but, uh, that rebuff <clears throat> and the scalpel. Sorry, Crescent, go for it. Yeah, the, the, the first time he does is in the cave after being tortured. Um, <laughs> so, yes, absolutely in Dark Age. Yeah. Um, and base, both times, basically, uh, Atlas is like, you know, the first time he's like, Stop! Stop using the mind's eye on me unless yeah, you want me yeah. to use it right back. And then this yeah. time, it's like <clears throat> he's already using the mind's eye. He's like, I know about the scalpel. Like, stop! Yeah. Stop it! Yeah. Which is interesting. We did have the discussion during Dark Age of the mind's eye and how many people have it. We know Apollonius wants it during Dark Age, but we learn mm -hmm. in this part of how much time Atlas is spent in the vault. Um, I think this comes yep. later in this chapter piece, but he knows he's read through all of Octavia. So it now pieces together why he's been training himself for years in the mind's eye, probably because of being in Octavia's vaults. Uh, but yeah, that's a good, good call out of the two correlation of Atlas being three steps ahead of him of like, but what are you doing? Like, you think that's going to work? Okay. Yeah, I think that was my section in Dark Age too. Oh <laughs> Look at all of the like mirrored. Yeah, you're our Atlas expert. Is what yeah. I'm yeah, I'm here for it. That man um, has my utmost respect, even though I don't think I actually agree with him. I you know, understand the logic system that he's built very, very well. What else do I have? The idea of Lysander as the savior of the rim. Mm -hmm. Oh, and the fact that he, that Lysander ex suspects him of, of being so powerful. Again, like he's in Lysander's head so much that Lysander's like, oh my God, did you make it so that we found that? <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, that, did like... you did you make make it so we stumbled upon the Vindabona? Yeah. Like, did you mean for me to find Seraphina? Like, bruh. <laughs> but that's what Atlas's <laughs> wild. Kind of whole thing of like, and it calls out at some point of the man that everyone fears and therefore thinks is on every planet. Right, because everyone for years has been like, what the fuck is Atlas doing? So is he on Mercury? Is he on Mars? Is he in the Rim? Is he on Venus? Jupiter? Can you, you can't actually be on Jupiter. Fine. A moon of Jupiter? <laughs> like. Well, you, the... you could, you could be on Jupiter, but like, you're mostly just inside Jupiter. Man, he's just cool, the storm just on, on Jupiter. He's the, yeah, he's, um. He's everybody's boogeyman. He's the kind of guy that barks and everybody goes, oh. <laughs> you know, he's cool. Good job, Pierce. Great bad guy. Great yeah, bad real. guy. Yeah. Yeah. I think that Atlas has the clearest read on Lysander and Lysander's motivations of any other character, of maybe even Lysander himself. What do you guys think about oh, that? Oh, 100% agree. 100% agree. Yeah. Yeah. Lysander's floundering at this point. Like, he thinks he knows what he's doing. Mm -hmm. But I mean, as we say, like, Atlas wouldn't let Lysander just be wandering around, knowing the plan, do it, like, carrying a scalpel and <laughs> Atlas was like 100% like you're not doing shit all and therefore that means that he can read Lysander in the next 10 steps like there's no way you can think your way out of this yeah, yeah. it's he like yeah. he talks about Lysander has 
his morals. And so mm -hmm. that probably is what holds him back. There's somebody else out there. Um, I can't put a name to whoever that if they're don't have the morals are not Atlas isn't going to trust them as much of like, hmm, you might actually have ish, take issue with doing this, this and this. Lysander's not going to do those things because he wants to stay morally superior through all of this. Right. He's like, so, okay. Is he just a kingmaker or is he a puppeteer? Like, what is actually, like, what role does Atlas see himself as having once all of the actual, like, pieces are in place? You know, he wants, he sees a more viable society at this stage because he sees Lysander's uh, morality placing inhibitions on him that for Ad Atalantia would not exist and therefore more chaos, more disorder, mm, greater cost, like economically in the long term would play out if Atalantia were to be the, the more ascendant uh, ruler of the society. And so he sees pragmatically that Lysander and his particular bouquet of characters are the, the, the better fit for Atlas's longer. Yeah. But like what what happens what happens to Atlas after Lysander is in place? Well it I, seems almost like I was gonna say I'm thinking I, long term of that of where does he, you know, even after Lysander, like does he have a plan for how this society how this setup works long term because ajax is gone so there is literally no raw after this it would have to be lysander does he trust that lysander is going to carry out the plan to his children to wherever and you would think atlas has thought enough through that this isn't going to be a one and done we're not just changing the society so that you know because that's the problem with a lot of dictators it's a problem with a lot of I think movements in general for good or for bad that you have, okay, hey, we've hit this great society for this person, but the moment there is a power vacuum, the moment there's a power struggle, any type of that one leader, die, he's, he's mortal. What happens long term is the thing that I keep thinking of of like, that's great you're putting it in, what stops this from going back to how it was? When jumping ahead a little bit, which we're at the end of that one chapter, and I think, yeah, I mean, it goes into chapter 49, it's kind of seamlessly, it goes a little middle chapter 49, but it seems like Atlas is gonna like recuse himself because he's talking yeah. about like meeting Fa out. Yeah. For drinks. Yeah. 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 Oh my gosh, they, they're basically going to go to Wyoming or Saskatchewan <laughs> and uh, Montana. Yeah, Montana, basically. That's hilarious. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that's my thing of like, what happens? I mean, and that's the whole thing, I think, why we get Morningstar and then to iron gold. Okay, so you've broken the society. We've made it better in this moment is the end of Morningstar. And the idea mm. of iron gold is that can't what last. What now? Exactly. So we've plunged ourselves into war. Okay, so let's say yeah. that the rim is gone, the republic is gone. The core what what is keeping them? We know that they are not aligned in the capacity Let's say that they all do in the same way under Octavia, they somewhat got together, but when is the next Augustus versus Bologna battle breakout, right? Like that was what Daryl was mm -hmm. able mm -hmm. to dissect and I don't know what the word is, blow leverage. up. Yeah, leverage. Yeah, leverage is a gold on gold and that's all it takes is this very small, these two families fighting for it all to blow up again. And it had nothing to do with the rim. It had nothing to do with, right? Like, so it's like Atlas, what's, mm -hmm. what's the long term, the a hundred year out plan? Well, 
like Atlas even calls it out. He's like, you know, do this horrible shit now. And there will be peace until the end of your life, basically. Like you will not not see conflict again until the end of your life. And I that's basically the same question is like, then what? Yeah. Then it implodes again. But okay, historically does that even hold up? Because you look at like post World War One Germany. Mm-hmm. Yep. They rallied real quick. Yep. Real. Did yep. they just not? Are we just to assume they just didn't get their asses handed to them hard enough? Because <clears throat> trauma apparently directly correlates and therefore is causal to whether or not uh, somebody decides to have a rebellion. I don't buy. Yeah. 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 Maybe Gosh. Atlas doesn't understand the world as well as he thinks he does. It's interesting because again, yeah, like his framework is great. His, um, how he gets to the conclusions that he gets to, the things that he looks to as inspiration make a ton of sense. But, and it's the same thing with Lysander that, and it's dangerous and it has always been dangerous part of humanity. If you start from a bad premise, it can follow a beautiful progression of logic and still end up being not correct, yeah. not not true, and bad ultimately. <laughs> mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, we can theorize all day, but we'll never, we'll never know. Or we might in Red God, but we'll never know. Mm hmm. Um, Is it? These are the conversations that I, one day when we're all old and gray and Pierce's solved part of the howler's den and we're all just hanging out around our scotches and bourbons and yeah. discussing the things that I want to know. So what was Atlas actually thinking? Yeah. I love it. Well, should we move on to the next piece of Atlas is we get to we get first which is really cool because i think up to this point the obsidian has been this race of people that like barely speak common it's always in these like blunt statements like as if it's their second language they're fresh off the ice or you get the eskimani that we know are like reptilian like you they always mm -hmm. seem to be the ones that are portrayed as lesser, even than the Reds. The Reds at least can be eloquently spoken. We know that the Helldivers can do math, like nobody's business. Like, but the Eskimani is just a force, like brute strength. And we suddenly get these characters that have like sitting around thinking worldly thoughts and like, down with their feelings and oh yes i was there and like feels like sitting around with your grandparents friends is the vibe i was getting off of them <laughs> like let's just oh yes him right like it's a little bit of like judgment of people a little bit of gossip circle of like ooh, where's this and like you know but at the same time has that like worldly statement i've seen things like it feels to me like your grandparents friends is who now are our obsidian like leaders like very interesting to me that to me was absolutely mind-blowing the first time i read it of like th these these are what Obsidian could be, because it's not the Ragnar. Even Ragnar, our favorite character, was blunt chocolate, right? Like, I'm thinking of the chocolate bar, like, fight, mm -hmm. right? Like, it's just these mm -hmm. statements that you knew there was a brain behind it, but it didn't come out. And now we have these, like, scholarly, like, as if they went to Oxford, learned... Socialites, David. almost. Yeah. 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 Like, super interesting. Um, yeah, so this chapter on the whole, what do you, where would you guys place it as like a top, uh, for me, you know, it's probably top three surprise of the whole 
series top three yeah. unveil like what the fuck moment uh thoughts what where does it fit for you? what the fall moment oh crescent so good <laughs> nice where where is it up there is it up there for you guys like oh for what sure. would you rank for reveals? What, what? yeah yeah like ooh there's a lot of reveals in a short amount of time in this like we're not even this isn't even fa has shown up all we're getting right now is his like underlings never mm -hmm. mind when he shows up and you get that he's been using the like taser yeah voice the voice thing. modulator <laughs> and then he like is a well-spoken like Englishman. Like it sounds like he's like in the upper courts and like could be talking to kings and like fucking hilarious. Yeah, I love I know, that. Go for it. That whole, that whole. <laughs> uh, <laughs> for everybody listening on audio, uh, Badger's got like a thought bubble that's uh, thumbs up occasionally. Just <gasps> seems like at random. Anytime it seems yeah, you can't thumbs, use your though. thumb anymore. <laughs> Just keep Sorry. it tucked. <laughs> yeah. Um, the thumbs of great power. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a, like, that whole, like, the whole kin shield thing yeah. is, like, for sure top five reveal for me. Yeah. yeah. Like, it's just it so... So not what's expected. I was delighted. Right. Like the <laughs> only word I can think of is like, oh, oh, oh. I was like, it's like, yeah, just so. You're, you're Raymond Holt eating a marshmallow. Yeah, I mean, what? Oh, look at the novelty and the delight of this. How amazing! Like, wow. Um, just because it's it was so unexpected, so thoroughly unexpected. I mean, Fa is over here uh, portrayed as the shrike from hyperion cantos with his giant uh thorn suit that he wears impaling people on it as he moves throughout his conquests just a beast of terror blood eagling people all over the place and like you know couldn't be a more dapper of a gentleman right mm -hmm. he, he's he's wearing Seer sucker. He's give he's giving three pizza suits with cravats. I mean, like, come on. Yeah. 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 I also like that uh he comes in and, and he's still got the voice modulator on. <laughs> and Alice is like, take that shit off. You sound insane. Yeah. Hard to enunciate with this thing on. Yeah, with this baritone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but can we give it up for um Tim Gerard Reynolds TGR. for yeah, yeah for yeah that his fa voice. voice is crazy. Okay, so legit, the first time I was listening to that, I had just finished up reading a moss flower book to my son out loud, and they have a lot of different characters, and I had chosen to give like the big bad character a <laughs> like level of of yeah. narration, and it was really hard from my throat. And so I was just thinking to myself when I was hearing Fa's voice, I was like, oh my God, that's so unsustainable. How is he going to do that? Yeah. So it turns out he wasn't. He doesn't have to. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't have to. That's so funny. Yeah. In a kimono? In a kimono? Yeah. Oh my God. You know Love he's it. the most comfortable of all time. Like. Yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah, I just, you know, it's not who you, in any capacity. So you get the reveal that Atlas is puppet master here, but then you get the reveal that he might not actually, because what's his real name? It's Wagner? Va Wagner. Wagner. Yeah. Wagner. Wagner Hefka. Wagner is like totally in on the plan understands what's happening he's not really being played. yeah he is he, just he is a true believer yeah. yeah and and then even when they're like hey we're gonna cut your reign short lysander's gonna take over kind of a thing he's like over the moon and he just wants to like retire yeah, Ly yeah lysander's like what what's his reaction gonna be like he's expecting him to just be like irate and he's like 
oh, thank God, I just, mm -hmm. I want to be done. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's beautiful. Uh, it's, um, it's, un it's, I've had people say that it's unbelievable. And in a way, it's so fantastical that it is almost unbelievable. But also, it's just within the scope of, you know, this universe and, and human nature. Yeah. And the reason I say human nature is because specifically, I think I point this out at another point time as well when we were on together i don't remember which specific episode but the hypocrisy of it yeah the the actual nerve of these people who say they're so idealistic about the society to have egalitarian relationships with the lowest of the low the most utilitarian tools in the toolbox the obsidians and to raise them up to the level that Atlas has raised uh, the Gorgons and Fa is um, just so deeply, deeply hypocritical. Yeah, absolutely love the reveal of love. I love Fa at this point. Like, I almost want to root for him other than it's you're sitting there being like, Bud, I like, do you not see how the golds have enslaved you. And I, I guess it's the same as Darrow of like, this gold is different this gold has treated us with kindness and compassion. Mm -hmm. um, and and to that note, like Lysander specifically notes the treatment uh, that Atlas gives the whole, the whole kin shield compared oh. to how he treats Atlas or uh, Ajax, Ajax, sorry. Yeah. Um, and he, he's like, you know, Ajax would have killed to get one of the smiles that Atlas lavishes on any of the kin shield. It's like, man. Yeah. Yeah, that is that is an excellent and very loaded note. Mm -hmm. There's a lot about that. Yeah. Yeah, super interesting, super. I mean, and then that alone gives a different side to Atlas that he's not this crazy, scary guy. He's gone through trauma, and we know trauma creates trauma, but the bonds he's decided to make out of all of that are to these specific people. Like, but I do enjoy that they talk about the differences of all the obsidian of the Eskimani, they call them reptiles. They're not humans anymore. That's what they've been made to being, and they are reptiles. Uh, and then talk about the Volk and, you know, where their allegiance lie, how they had to win them over, and, like, the Braves being kind of savages and not fully being on board. They were kind of questioning the whole Sephi thing still. In Tier Morga, where they just kind of like roll their eyes every time it's brought up. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, like looking at, they know all the differences between each type of obsidian and where that falls. And so the ones we've seen versus them um, and what they've been used for. And, you know, very interesting to see that division within the color. A piece to me that is that exists at least in to be able to be chewed in thought because it's not really discussed super in depth anywhere in the series, but something that I think about from time to time is the genetic versus like the epigenetic layers to this. So you've got the genetics, like the pro, like the gene carrying the code to do a thing but then environment and nurture uh influence how the gene is expressed and we see i think examples of that in the Askamani and even further back in the last at the end of the last segment or beginning of this segment where uh they find i think it's the last segment where they find no it's this segment no, there the where they find yeah, the, the where they find made out of bodies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
And he's questioning, like, is this the Volk that I knew? And it's like, okay, well, on the gene that they have, the genes that they have are the, sim- the same, more or less, genes that the Oskamani have. And that exists in both, but has been flipped. The expression of that gene has been flipped in other ways yeah. in the Republic because of nurture, because of opportunity, because of environmental factors that the Oskamani most certainly do not have which they talk about in terms of like their brutality and their intertribal wars and that just continuing the cycle of brutality within the Askamani. So I think that um, I don't have the sophistication to talk on that in Mm -hmm. much, much greater depth. But again, somebody else does. That would be great. Somebody else is out there. (laughs) Yeah. Let's come in and do an epigenetics of every color, please. (laughs) Can you imagine? I would that would love, be so like, fascinating. It's one of my, like, always in the back of my mind of how did each color get to this point? Especially because we know, mm-hmm. starting with Red Rising, like, the background of the Reds. So mm-hmm. it's like, okay, so they're the Irish. We get it. They've been in the mines. What that looks like, how that's going to change. But, like, how did the Obsidian get to be the way they are? How did the Greens get bred the way they are like would love that and then what is in their dna what's coded to be a certain way and what is just that the golds have kept them a certain way like i think that's nature versus nurture for sure yeah i love that yeah um what do you guys think about so like the last like third of this chapter is just like all atlas setting up sort of a push toward um next steps Mm -hmm. um for himself like why does he need vila you know why is gaia even still alive you know you've got the what is the granddaughter name it's thalia 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 maybe what is her name? Thalia. Yeah. yeah. With a yeah. TH. Well, I love that they're like, why did you keep Gaia alive? And they're like, what kind of monster kills his mother? Like, you're like, mm. listen, we've got boundaries here. Yeah. You can't kill the mom. Like, <laughs> but, uh, and we know that Gaia killed all of her grandchildren in order to. Mm-hmm. almost pr- either protect them from either being taken hostage or because of the reveal we are about to talk about in a moment knowing that this thing exists in their blood is so important but like but can't bring her couldn't bring herself to kill the youngest and then we know that the other like the captors also never killed the youngest they only needed um the one and we get the secondary as well that honestly just every time i you said that and i cringed i read it like three times this is the third time through i've read this and every single time that just hurts right that just really really hurts as a person with kids in their life like that uh, hmm. like i can't imagine either of like the m- grandmothers m- my grandmother my son's grandmothers like i can't imagine either yeah. any of them none of them yeah would be able to they they would themselves i mean i think what you suggest skipper where it's like it would keep them from greater harm yeah maybe the only line of reasoning but to do it yourself just hurts to even think about. I touch it. I I go there, I touch it, and I immediately run away from it because it hurts a whole lot. Yeah. Yeah. But I think, well, and it's interesting because you talk mother's love, but if that's the case, then why was the youngest one spared? Unless she realized of like, hey, they're not going to abuse 
a child so young, but like, yeah, absolutely devastating that portion. I think you just get to the point of over my, my read on it is that she just got to a point of complete and utter overwhelm. Yeah. Whereas like, this is the baby of the family of the entire family. Yeah. And I can't, this is not just my, my baby's baby, but this is the baby baby of the entire family. Yeah. And I cannot. Yeah. Crazy. And then it takes Lysander kind of negotiating of, well, what if you need a second? And he doesn't even, I think, at that point understand what's happening. But like, hey, keep a backup, keep up. Like, what if, you know, we're partnered together? And they're like, she's like prepubescent. And he's like, hey, long term. Like, because I think this is a moment where Lysander sees this of like, I think Lysander feels for the person, but he also is very obsessed with the ending of families. And so mm. is looking at mm -hmm. her and is being like, this is going to be the last raw. Like you're going to let the family die with her. Uh, and I think can't bring himself a little bit to have that happen. Or, and or, I mean, I, I guess maybe, maybe let's say an and or, not an and or. Um, Atlas counting on Lysander's morality, which we yeah. know he seems to have a read on, to step in and save that because they make this note like Thalia looks like Atlas. Yes. Right? There's a certain connection there. And again, same thing with like, if this is another example, I, I would maybe not have said that, but this comes right on the heels of Atlas giving Lysander the opportunity. Oh, you don't like this plan that I've created where you get to rise to ascendancy at the um, expense of Fa where you come in and you're the vanquisher and the savior, but in the meantime, all of the moons are gonna get sacked and like, Lysander takes more moral exception to that. Yeah. And then Atlas is like, well, you could choose a moon to save. Oh, yeah. <laughs> get the me. illusion okay. of choice. Yeah. yeah. And, then, and then again, this sense of, I have literally no agency in this, in this matter whatsoever. So, that happened again it's kind of horrifying the the only time in this entire series that i can have a single iota of empathy and related relatability to lysander is in his lack of agency and just psychological distress at being in proximity to atlas i can't imagine being manipulated to that degree by somebody like atlas that's that seems pretty terrifying mm -hmm. yep yeah Um, but that's when we then also learn of what is hanging out in the raw vault. What yeah, the, the, re the reason thing. we've we've got a raw. Yeah. Mm hmm And it's... So... Yeah. I'm curious why Atlas's blood isn't good enough. He doesn't have or a scar. Like he's... Oh, that's right. <clears throat> That's right. Okay, so then what goes into the scars that they can't just give him a scar? How is the scar yeah. made that changes? He was leveraged as a bargaining chip after the right. after the burning of Rhea to yeah. mm -hmm. the society. And he grew up in court and under the tutelage of the grimaces and right. the loons in the society. But he, at that young age, was removed from the culture and the society of the rim, and he never attended an institute. 
Right, right, right. I get why he doesn't mm -hmm. have a scar, but yeah, why no, but does like, that change his DNA to not be good enough? Like, what is in point. that scar yeah. ceremony that whatever, however the genetics to open said vault is what I'm going to call it, hmm. He, the scar is that important? Maybe they, they use some sort of leviathan toxin yeah. in the scarification process. Perhaps. Dragon, dragon, Drake dragon. or Leviathan. Yeah. <gasps> we haven't even gotten into the fact that we had a dragon die this chapter. We'll come back to that because I'm traumatized by that. Um, but yeah, perhaps. <laughs> but yeah, that's the interesting thing to me of like, okay, so he doesn't have a scar, so it doesn't work. But why does that affect? Yeah. So, Interesting. Yeah. But yeah. So but anyway, dragon. what it is? No, no, no. we've got so to we... talk about what the <laughs> thing that we we'll go back to the dragon. So the thing in the vault is this Edme. We... Yeah, Edme. I don't know even like weapon. I guess is the best use. It's a virus. It, yeah, can eradicate an entire color off of a planet. Yep. Like, that's crazy. And, and the ramifications of what could occur. Like, I would love to know what Atlas's plan is. Does he have something already, like, in mind? Or does he want to have it in his back pocket in case he needs it? Yeah, as a contingency, or is it something yeah. that he's already got? If you to? have something like that... Why don't you use it? Is my question. Like, why has the rim been sitting on that for seven hundred and fifty years or whatever it's been? Well, because they've always had a use for every color in the rim. But why not use it against the society or, or society? This is what anything. I was thinking of today. I didn't think about this. Yeah. Read yeah. Through. Fair enough. But my thing today is. What if Atlas dropped it against the golds on, let's say, Mars? Right? We all assume he wouldn't use it against golds. At least I wouldn't. The first time I read this through, I didn't think he would use it against golds. But if he was to use it and eradicate on, let's say, Mars, or if, I assume if it works on planet, it would work on a moon. So Phobos... Getting rid of, I don't, well, they're no longer on Phobos, are they? But Mustang, Victra, the Telemannus, like, that's your move. If the core and the rim are at war, you use it against the golds on a planet where they at least have the majority. So you might lose a few of your own people, but chip. But maybe not. Maybe you know to pull them off and get an obsidian to drop it on this place and then kill off your enemies. I want to know why nobody in the... Because that is the play, right? Like, you don't just use it against... You don't actually even just use it against your enemies. You use it against everybody on your own side, too, that has any, any claim to power whatsoever. Just wipe yeah. everybody out. And your faction comes in and that's that, period. Yep. And so what would have stayed the rim's hand from using that before? <laughs> and how do you use, like, where things stand now, that seems like a very interesting dilemma but it does seem, at least at this particular juncture, in the book, like the only actual play is against gold. Yeah. Is it a one and done? Is that maybe why? Nobody's used it before. Yeah, you hold maybe. it back so that, you know, this isn't the problem. We might have a different one in the future. Well, we might have mm -hmm. a different, right? It's the, it's the good China that you never it's, use. It's the, it's the RPG the item cache. Yeah, that uh -huh. like no no, I'm not gonna use it now because like so my good China I might need it later. is like yeah, I'm waiting for the queen to come, right? Like I'm waiting for the ep like upper echelons 
to be able to use it. Yeah, as you say, the RPG couch of like, do you, is it a one and done and that's why they haven't used it? Or is it the honor of the raw that they're like, hey, we understand and taking it from Selenius, flashes Selenius there. Oh, I thought you were doing it and then you are grabbing a beer. Um, mm. <laughs> got the Selenius bust, Selenius O. Augustus, uh, if you will. uh those who know know uh you know so they take it from selenius because maybe they didn't trust selenius with it but then why wouldn't you destroy it unless you knew somewhere we were going to use this if it's a one and done you're going to hoard it away or maybe it's been used before on some very small moon or whatever and they know the power it holds and what toll it took but we've lost that document or whatever. Like that's, if it's not a one and done, you would assume somebody has used it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm sure some, some of this, cause there's no way something that big is going to get just swept under the rug yeah. from the, from this point on. So I'll be curious to see what transpires now that it's been talked about. Um, that's always, it's always, again, we go back to the use of Chekhov's gun theory in yeah. Red Rising Universe. You know, Pierce is very, he said that he's intentional. He doesn't just throw uh, red herrings out there. Yep. So I'm sure we'll learn something else about it at some point. <laughs> For sure. Mm-hmm. But yeah, very interesting. Very interesting. All right, now, are we good on this yeah. part? Can I talk about the dragon? <laughs> yeah. Well, we can talk about Volga. Well, yeah. yeah but we can talk about of... Volga and the dragon. We'll talk about the dragon because I feel like then I can segue into Volga. Of like, is Volga okay with this? Like, Volga, our animal lover? is And it's funny because I know for a fact, I don't even have to look it up. The text I sent Crescent was like, dragon! And then like two pages later, like, dragon is dead. <laughs> It's like immediately like, yeah, dragon. <laughs> and we know that the dragon like whimpers and they like Lysander says it sounds like he's calling out for his ch- like her children. And like it's just the sad they've just brought it back to use it as a feast, which is a very like I feel like Viking like idea in my mind. Any of the obsidian feasts to me are the dead of winter Viking feasts um which is how you survive back in the days uh i could get into canadian history on that is, one which, but... is there a parallel between the dragon and gaia oh well i mean in theory yes i mean in in how house raw is set up and then you know the significance of the dragons in House Ra. What are you thinking, Crescent? Well, you're specifically talking, the crying out for the children. Is that the uh, line mm-hmm. that? Yeah, right. And then it's it's the sigil beast, which I I suppose I can't guarantee, but like you would think that that means it's the oldest and largest. Well, yeah. Gaia is not the largest, but she is the She's oldest. The oldest. Mm-hmm strongest is i think the you word know, that uh-huh. to be used i would put gaia as the strongest of the raw mm-hmm. even though remember when we meet her back at iron gold and she makes everyone think she's crazy and then we learn mm-hmm. that she's not she just is like fucking cavix energy right there yeah yep um yeah that's a good call out and then yeah she gets the dragon gets um killed and fa himself jumps and rips the heart out throws it into a fire and then they feast it's very very sad yeah i feel like that's that's perfectly good metaphor for gaia at this point yeah Mm -hmm. yep so sad but yeah yeah, then, then then we then we learn that volga has not been like in battle with Fa. Mm-hmm. She's she's gone hunting with him. She's the one that that captured the dragon. Yeah. But but he doesn't want to force her to kill 
with him, basically. Yeah. Which is an interesting kind of protecting her in a manner. And we know that his, like, end game is to retire with her and give her, like, a Pegasus farm. Like, yeah, she'll be happy. Mm -hmm. Give her a ranch. She'll be fine. Like, very interesting where that plays out. And I would like to point out at this point that, like, Lysander tries to ask. Is it Lysander or Atlas? One of them tries to ask about, like, what are your thoughts on Volga? And gets cut off, but they clearly, like, they are willing to gossip about everybody else. But they're not willing to gossip about Volga, which makes me think they have hesitation on Volga. Because if they're going to praise her, you just write out, like, yeah, great, she's good. That's kind of the point that I was going to make, too, is it's like, there's still, to, for me, like, a, a veil yeah. of understanding of what's going on with Volga that feels tense and uh a little loaded yeah i worry for her is she plotting is she malleable like where where is she at because she was so vulnerable when she got brought in yeah yeah i like that um that she tried to kill him first off mm -hmm. yeah but her. then I don't like that he was able to convince her that she should stop doing that. Yeah. Exactly. And and now she seems to be like more or less on his side. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I, I read that and that's what my takeaway is. I'm like, it sounds like she's totally Jill where she is. Yep. Which I doesn't seem like our girl. But yeah, uh, no. but also like it's like, so completely how, different. Is it though? Because think of how Ephraim used her and pushed her around. And if she is just looking for family, if she's just looking for a father figure, it kind of does work its way into like if people can justify and manipulate her in the capacity, like that's what Ephraim did. We love to think of Ephraim in this, like great honorable thing and always have it out but like he was kind of terrible to her for a while oh absolutely and she yeah. followed along like a golden retriever and now sure at the beginning her first off reaction is i shouldn't be here let me try and kill you but if she's then given an option of i will protect you i will make you my daughter i think volga would take it like i don't think it's out of character I just think that we don't like seeing that side of her. But I think she does kind of sway to whoever, Lyria, Victra. How fast did she form an alliance with Victra? Because it's this mentality of, hey, there's only the three of us. We have to keep ourselves alive. So then she forms an alliance with Victra super fast off the bat. She's now doing it here. Like, I think Volga is just somebody who's highly susceptible to wanting love and affection and that makes her like easy to manipulate and so fa has taken advantage of that but i don't even know if he's fully he doesn't think he's taken advantage of that i think he thinks like i'm offering her her best life and she's willing to accept it in the same way ephraim offered her the best life victor offered her life in general um right so i don't think it's mm -hmm. that out of character for volga to act in this way right just seeing her through the eyes of lyria as we have in the mm -hmm. last few cha chapters yeah that that's the part that then hurts of mm -hmm. we know it's not the side we want her to be on but i think for her personally she doesn't really have an alliance to anyone or anything and she just kind of goes with whoever is willing to protect her and give her a reason to live. Yeah. Family, connection, yeah. Ata. Yeah. There's that I, I, I buy it. I'm there with you. Yeah. I'm, pick, I'm picking it up. Yeah. I guess the only thing that makes me, that made me think, like that's out of character is like it's literally the whole reason 
she went with him. Right. Is like. He will bring me close and then I will kill him. Uh huh. Yeah. Hmm. Does but that bring what we 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 get a brief mention of our mm-hmm. worthy boy. you miss I've switched to drinking rum so I could drink my worthy rum. Nice. Yeah. It's a good sipping rum. It's still in my teacup, but um yeah. Because it's fancy. It's fancy. It's worthy worthy park rum. Yeah, yeah, we do get a break. And I think it mentions that Fa would have liked that from. Oh, he yeah. He said um, Atlas's favorite knife. Yeah. yeah. Which is weird to think about. And he like actually that. called. Yeah. Yeah, it would not. Yeah. yeah. Um, he calls. Like, he actually says that was. Like, uh, says something about him being worthy. Mm-hmm. Like, in. In that one little paragraph. Yeah. Yep. Howlerhollow.net, by the way. Gone too, yes. gone too soon. Gone way too soon. Mm-hmm. Well, is that our end of Lysander? Yeah. For, for now? Yeah, pretty much. Not the end of Lysander, just the end of his chapters. We wish it was Ah, nuts. <laughs> He'll be back next week. Unfortunate that we just spent two about. hours talking about him. I know. Yeah. We did get him out of the way because I was like, I don't want to end on him. I would like to end on Darrow, so that's why he's that. But let is let's segue. You are wearing your worthy T-shirt from Hollow dot net, which is the Dens merch site. Badger, well, it's have... just the Dens site in general, but that is we yes, have a nice correct. shop. Yes, correct. Uh, and then. Uh, Badger, you have Hallercon on the signed Pierce shirt. Mm-hmm. So a lit escalates, uh, escalates merch item, and yep. then you have one that's a completely different Red Rising related merch. What I oh what I'm wearing? Yeah, yeah. Yes, I have the There's No Therapy in Space, which is our Fade to Obsidian Red Bubble. It comes on T-shirts. It comes on aprons it comes on pretty much anything um uh, i don't think we actually have this one on an apron but yeah it comes on everything uh so check us out at redbubble.com just look up fade to obsidian and you will find us um yeah and speaking of uh aprons everybody go drop your suggestions for no that's gonna be apron right designs now. oh it's ah uh, well Next sorry you guys are too late Next Enjoy. episode, we'll be announcing what the Cassius apron and maybe Diomedes. No one's given us anything for Diomedes, and I feel like Daddyomedes is too obvious, and we already have that on hollerhollow.net. Uh, but... Fresh Trout Chef. <laughs> oh! <laughs> I like that. I might have to go on. I was thinking while we were recording this that we should make um, a shirt that says Pierce is that a reference? That's, that's absolutely a, we should. Let me yeah. write that down. Yeah, I feel like we need some merch that says Pierce is that a reference? Uh, if you ever so, hear something we say during an episode and you're like, that would be hilarious, I would wear that on a shirt. Shoot me a message and I'll see what I can do. So we. As you're doing that, and before we've dived into Darrow real quick, we talked about Atlas being evil daddy. We've got uh, Diomedes' daddyotomies, or daddy medes. And um, and then I always think of Romulus as original daddy. So I feel like we need a, a, a family tree, a genealogical tree of, the, of the daddies. Yeah. The daddy raw. That's a uh, meringue last episode called out of uh, OG daddy being Romulus, but then forgot Romulus's yeah. name. So, yeah, I'm going to put the She had been tree. drinking. We'll forgive her. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, that would be a good one for sure. Yeah, we love our raw. I think it is 
comes down to even Atlas has in some capacity, and we see it more in these chapters than anywhere else, some kind of honor. And we see Romulus in his, I know people have used the like love quote in their weddings. I wouldn't go that far because it is the weirdest love ever. I think it's a toxic love between Romulus and Dido. I think on Dido. Yeah, but it's a good, it's such a good quote though. I know, but the background of it, no judgment if you've used it, but I look at it every time and I'm like, okay. Um, but I think we see the love he has for Dido. We see Diomedes, who we are about to talk about a little bit more, and just his honor, how he holds himself together. Oh, spoil just what a little bit. What he looks like when he's coming oh. out of his uh, Oh my God. I mean, even yeah, I, thought, I thought that short. was I thought that was stopping earlier. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> we are not getting into that. <laughs> um, I was going to say, spoil just a little bit, that later in the book, we'll see some other chef's kiss moments from Diomedes that I think just everyone who, you know what, I wouldn't, I was going to say everyone who has an interest in men, but I think everyone on the planet can appreciate the honor, the integrity, the gentleman that is Diomedes. And we see as well atlas in this chapter has i don't know if honor is the word it is it's a little bit of honor he's got conviction he's got conviction the treatment of the obsidian is actually higher than we have seen most people with it like the like the mastermind that's i'm very into like men who can like highly intelligent and so as evil as he is, I look at this and I'm like, oh, I could listen to you talk all day. Tell me all your plans. Like, I think the raw just hit in a specific way that makes everyone go, hmm, yes, get me one of those, please. <laughs> I would like uh, one I think of those. Der- I think Mustang actually sums it up because I think it's a, this is a centerpiece of the Den- Venn diagram between Darrow and the raw is competency yeah yeah Yeah. very much so yeah but yeah we love our daddy Roz we love them (laughs) even though the funniest thing is Diomedes is the only one who is not actually a daddy (laughs) yeah much to Ori's dismay (laughs) I was about to say, like, (laughs) have we seen a gold pink, uh, pink thread there? Some were probably on the line. They'd have to see a carver first. Diomedes would have to get down with that. Like, come on, Diomedes, we know. I was going to say, we also, I feel like, uh, do pinks give birth? Like, how... Some No. 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 Because it would absolutely destroy them, like... They do not oh, have yeah. own structure to carry a child. No, she, she can't even child. push Severo without breaking a finger. And Severo's not even a big gold. No. Yeah. All right, well, shall we jump? No, I think right they in? specifically call out that their, like, their reproductive system has been... Yes. It's whites, for sure, uh, pinks, for sure, and grays, for sure, Yeah. that I have noted so far that are bred sterile yeah maybe blues no blues not or... wait no not great not great not, not great okay, but what so then what what was that comment <clears throat> that Roan made where he's like we gave up our right to legacy when we gave up our right to have children it's maybe the praetorians can't have kids okay maybe it's like a specific class of gray mm-hmm and maybe it's like an after the fact kind of thing. Yeah, aren't the blues all test tube babies? Cuz they're all born into the sect. Hmm. Um Yeah. Not specifically, but It's like worded in a manner that it doesn't sound like. I yeah, I don't think they're a conventional birth. I don't think they're test tube, but like like they talk about how blues like share lovers, they share 
right. air, they share space. Like, <clears throat> so it's probably just more of like a societal thing, not a right. medical thing. Oh, okay. The blues remind me of the Belters like a whole lot in the Expanse oh, yeah. series. Yep. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. All right. Well, let's get into Darrow. And, yeah, let's let's uh, hop on the Archimedes. Get on the Archie. Uh, and uh, where do we start with this? Is with the finding of... No, it's with several... It's laughing. with several's laughter. And the rest yeah. of them, because they're going to the debris, the rest of them are somber, they're looking out into space, holy shit, what's happening, and Severo's cackling. Just he is in full, I feel he's like, just a ball of nihilism at this point. I feel like Severo doesn't have other laughter. He only like, cackles. his laughter is only cackle. Like We just had a howler get renamed by Pierce Cackler. Yeah, we did. That? that was um tunes, yeah. Yeah, Cackler Nay Tunes. Nice. Mm-hmm. Nice. Uh yeah, there's uh I I picture it as Stitch. You know, when he uh, maniacal oh, laughing. Yeah. <laughs> Let me hit my microphone during that. Maniacal laughter. Yeah. Yeah, he is definitely the stitch, like his his laugh is just I mean I kind of get it. Like, these are the people who he knows, and we know it. Well, we'll find out during this that everyone but Darrow knows that. Yeah. That, that you know, Ulysses is gone. Yeah, and so Severo's going through some shit, and while the Rim was not actually in any capacity responsible for that, in fact, Fa is the one who then crashed the ship, takes the Pandora. Leaves them at the mercy of the red hand. You get it that he just wants anyone who is not their allies to die. And yeah. he is so happy to find this debris field that everybody else is like, dear God, like, what is this? Yeah, this is like this intro is the uh, tone that is the tone of like these two chapters, the Darrow POV chapters, um, very much so. And you're right. It, I think that's a good way of characterizing it, of him wanting, to, he wants everyone to share in his suffering, except, I mean, it really not even at the exclusion of his allies. Yeah. He is so hurt that he wants other people to hurt so that his hurt does not feel so profoundly isolated. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, like he he basically immediately starts lashing out at Darrow. You know, he's like, what's the matter? Like, are you so mad that an obsidian is better than you in space? Like, why do you think why do you think that this armada could be so thoroughly destroyed? There's no possible way that it could be done. Yeah. In a, you know, quote unquote, fair fight. It's like, why, like, do you think obsidians are trash? Like, yep. And Daryl was like, no, you fuckwit. <laughs> like, that's not how fleets die. Yeah. Like, and there's no, no casualties on the other side. Like, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, remember just a minute ago we were talking about the the genetics of the of the Oskamani and the Obsidians and the brutality mm-hmm. that exists in the violence. Like, this is where Darrow, this is the point where Darrow is questioning that for himself as well. Yeah. Because of uh, the Crescent, the Obsidian Crescent. Yeah. That mm-hmm. was built out of... Um, Civilians, yeah. basically. And it's like it 400 meters. Yeah, it's yeah. like 400 ridiculous. meters from point to point. Ugh. Yeah. That's huge. Just floating there, everybody wired together. Okay, is it also gross that in my head immediately I'm thinking, like, is this just arts and crafts time? Take some corpse. Like, blah. 
who who's responsible for making that like that's your job is to arts and crafts some corpse together bah. Like well, the uh, Askamani, as they point out later on in one of the Lysander chapters, they say meat is meat. Yeah. Yeah. So for them, that, that kind of butchery it goes back to, I mean, we've seen this before. We've seen it in what seems to be a slightly more civilized container when they uh, are uh, in on the way to Asgard and there's the obsidians and then there's the cast off of obsidians that That's are the right. corpse eaters yeah mm. okay hold up are the askamani reavers what's a reaver firefly yeah i haven't watched firefly. they're basically people that have gone out to the edge of space and gone insane pierce and is that they... a reference pierce is that a reference yeah, yeah. Pierce, is that a reference <laughs> I just had a thought. I'm like, hold the fuck up. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. See? Um, Yeah, okay, moving on from the absolutely disgusting arts and crafts. Uh, (laughs) Cassius and and Lyria hunch in two pilot seats, staring out at each other. There's some point in here where he mentions, where Darrow mentions Rona. And... Uh, Yeah, so Lyria hid out like Rona. Like, he's annoyed that she hid out. Right. He's he's impressed with how well that, like, how seriously she's taking learning all the systems of the ships. Because there's... It's later. It's later that um, Ori... Oh, it's Ori is trying to get the message from Athena. And Cassius says, Lyria, go with her and learn how to do that. And Lyria just Mm -hmm. immediately is like, yep, done, deal. Okay. And follows Ori to learn how to get the message from Athena. Because we've got at this point that these daughters have vacated. Yeah, the sun Mm -hmm. is down. Mm-hmm. The sun is down. Yeah, they're they've initiated the the fallback plan. But what jumped out at me, relationships wise, is like the whole Lyria and Rona dichotomy. Cassius never even knew Rona. Cassius only knew of Rona as a loss in the context of of losing also Alexander, and for now, um, Lyria to exist in a space that is making Darrow have Rona vibes feels away. Yeah. Has some, has some feels attached to it. Also, I wanted to point out that I felt it was slightly hypocritical of Darrow to mentally judge um, their relationship. Dar- uh, oh. Cassius's and and Lyria's relationship, like Cassius is the last person I would think a red would like. Like, oh, okay, he's basically your third wife, bro. You realize <laughs> that, right? Second, well, yeah. Um, yeah. I yeah. see. I didn't read it so much as as judging, more as just like being surprised. Okay. More like you know. Like I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have expected it, but like I'm not unhappy about it. Yeah. Right. Yet, Darrow the Red at the Institute instantly fell in love with Cassius. Yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. So I just find okay, so maybe less judgy, but still, for bordering on hypocritical in the sense that. Seems to lack the self-awareness to realize that he completely fell in the exact same way. Correct. I also do yep. think it shows a lot of growth on Cassius' side of Cassius, you know. And and Darrow compares Lyria to Lysander and Pytha, and Pytha's not gold. But I think it does show how far Cassius has come that he is looking at Lyria and ori in the same capacity he is looking at the golds of like 
this is someone who needs to learn how to do all these things. And I'm not going to doubt that she can do them because she's a gold, right? In the same way of like, oh, mm-hmm. well, the pink is right now doing stuff that a green should be doing. Like, should, right? Like, later, the pink is actually acting as the yellow. And mm-hmm. like he is at this point of understanding that all the colors can do all the things. And we are seeing that in real time with his relationship with Lyria of Mm -hmm. I can get along with you drink make you like a confidant as if you are a red or sorry as if you're a gold I can trust you with my ship like you're a blue I can trust you in other capacities as if you're a green or an orange to fix and do things around the ship like I think it's a huge huge character development that we see and it's you know maybe he's been like this for years but it is the proof that cassius is Mm -hmm. on the side of the republic and not the society that he's no longer you know well she's a red i dismiss her so i think that's a huge call out there the last chapter when they're comparing like drinks and the is is just so cute. The the call sign and drink, yeah, mm-hmm. interaction is just yeah, adorable. Yeah. Um, yeah, of like finally someone of like <laughs> some decent company. Yeah, that's the yeah. Um, I, I y'all probably know offhand. I've forgotten because I don't remember all the things that Pierce has said he's read in over the times, but the specific passage that they quote here from a path to the veil when life springs forth death follows behind when goodness is found evil is close at hand the path straddles the boundary between these things really hits like uh brandon sanderson's way of kings quote oh. to me big time yeah i, I just have that as the a first note. ideal yeah basically yeah first I ideal from Sanderson, yeah. but i wouldn't be shocked if pierce has read sanderson Mm -hmm. at least some of it anyway yeah yeah i do think then for server to follow it up by calling it a dusty ass tome again is funny comedic relief but it's starting to get like dark (laughs) Mm -hmm. starting to get kind of dark um and then we still get a little bit more comedic relief before we get into I mean, yeah, I think it's going back and forth between, like, actual light humor to dark humor for a little while here, back and forth. Mm -hmm. Don't don't you tell me you're going to say fly like an eagle or whatever. That's my favorite. If you say fly like an eagle. (laughs) Starting now. Now. That's my favorite. It's like, watch this. Debris hits the... (laughs) Starting now. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> love Cassius for this. I can't believe I'm saying I love Cassius. How many five. Five books I sat there and was like, meh, who is he? And now I'm like, damn it. Yeah, damn at this I, I mean, Cassius. I've been fully on board with Cassius since Dark Age, but this feels gratifying for that. Yeah. 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 For sure. And so we get Diomedes. Well, that's so, uh, we pick up, so we get that the daughters have left oh, yeah. mm-hmm. um, Calico, so then what's our next plan? We have to go to Sungrave, but then there is a pinging happening, and Ori says it's connected to a heartbeat. So that's why, like, there's so many distress signals. We need to follow that one, because it's connected to a heartbeat. We later learn that it is a call sign that she is well mm-hmm. aware, because it yeah, is it's a what raw the raw family. Uses. Yeah. And so we pick up, and I love the idea that they use the god killer uh, armor as, like, astronaut suits. Mm -hmm. Like, that's how, like, they're like, meh, we'll just put on our, like, war armor to use, like, to do a spacewalk. And they're able to get... I mean, it makes perfect sense, though, right? Like... Yeah, it's good. What else are they going to use? You would think on a spaceship they would have some kind of astronaut gear, but it works. They do. God killers. <laughs> Quicksilver's like, they don't 
need spacesuits. God killer. Yeah. God killer. Gods live in space, okay? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. You're right. My bad. Um, no therapy in space, but there is gods. <laughs> Again, there is battle nice armor segment. rated for space. Yeah. Uh, which yep. that? Never mind. I'm not even going to go down that tangent. We're already at two and a half hours. Uh, so they pull him out. They're able at that point of being like, "This is clearly a gold." It's someone who was awake enough to put on armor and then put themselves back into whatever trance they're in. This guy's mm-hmm. got to be brain dead. But then they get him back to the Arky. They know it's a gold. They kind of go through everything. And then the final reveal is... And I feel like us as the reader, I knew. It's like, this is going to be oh, diabetes. Yeah. Like, you knew because Lysander threw him off. Like, this is it. But it's that gasp from the Ori. Of, like... And that's the moment that it's like, yeah, Diomedes is back. And we've learned that after Lysander pushed him off, he did come back around, was able to put on the armor, and then put himself in such a meditative stance that it lowered his oxygen, it lowered everything, and that's the reason he is not brain dead. Like I think Badger's just over here jealous. I was as gonna fuck. say <laughs> Badger talk us through I, mean, the, I don't know, science of that. <laughs> That's why we're going through the paths of the veil, my friends. Yeah. <laughs> like there's there's only one one path forward, and that is to be able to have that kind of mastery. I mean, it's not impossible to put yourself in like very low metabolic threshold, right? Mm-hmm. And that's where that's basically where he's at. And we're assuming that golds have much greater capacity for that than a standard Homo sapien. Yep. So, yeah, I love the the piece by piece reveal as Darrow is just like, it's like, oh shit, this isn't like some backline pixie. The guy's got like meat cleaver hands and meaty yeah. forearms, and he's basically like sizing him up. Darrow. Yeah, he's Darrow. Like a massive chest. A- Barrel shoulders chest. as wide as mine. Mine, like, yeah. Mm-hmm. Are we all? I know. We're all just, you know, waiting to faint <laughs> over the reveal. Darrow is blatantly bisexual. <laughs> he doesn't realize it, but that is exactly what is going. Like he, he has like <sighs> battlefield loves. I think he's so oblivious, though. And actually, we get oh, into that so again bad. later on. Oh, is that but, weird? Yes. Yeah. Like, it's like the second or third call out of of Baldir as well. Yeah. Yep. That everyone's like, he's fucking in love with you. And Darrow's like, no, he's not. Like, he's just like, no, he sure. like, li- really wants to fuck you, my guy. It's okay, Darrow. Mm-hmm. I also don't know when people like me. <laughs> it's fine. Some of us are oblivious that way. We have to be straight up told. <laughs> yeah. Um, interesting. Darrow's interesting to me in that way. Darrow's like largely, like, aside from Mustang and, and, um, Eo, like he's he largely functions as like a man apart in that way, which I find I've known known people like that. It's it's totally plausible. It's not common, yeah. But it is funny that all the bisexual men of the series are way into him, <laughs> <laughs> including but not limited to Valdir and Cassius yeah. in their own ways, yeah. For sure. But yeah. But yeah, after he's done studying Diomedes' whole body, we get the reveal that it is. They like have to like shave off whatever's on his face and there. There Yeah, he it's is. that the black egg that the mm-hmm. Atlas. And again, with. even after it's like revealed, it's then like his black and gray or ba- black and gold hair is swept mm-hmm. from his face. Like I didn't know Only we if you think it is Diomedes Al Ra. Yeah, I didn't know we were in the romance section describing the hair. <laughs> like that's the right, and it's not life. from Ori's POV. No, it's from Darrow's POV. It's from Darrow that the yep. hair is swept across the face. <laughs> yeah, and there he's he is. ready. Just he's ready to swoon. Aren't we all ready? 
He's swooning. He's in the act of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, um, Swoon City, Population Darrow. Known, well, we kind of know guess. Cat, like Cassius feels for Diomedes as the, like, he saved my life. But I would have loved to have his point of view in this moment of, like, his reveal of that emotional, like, hey, he saved my life. I now get that return of saving his. But also just what that... I would, you know, there's always... We, we're, we're, we can never get all the POVs we want, but Cassie's mm-hmm. in that moment is one that I would have loved. And then to counter that, we get Severo immediately trying to kill him. <laughs> and then yep. I like that he's like, no, 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 not his throat. We have to use him for answers. Like, I will take off his toes. You start with the digits. <laughs> like, oh, dear God. <laughs> it's yeah. Unlike- Okay. No, you, you go he's- first, Crescent. Well, and like, he's using... He's using the threat of torture of Diomedes to like gauge how on their side basically Ori is. Yeah. Like, man. Not just Ori though. It's shit. also it's also a way of getting under Darrow and under Darrow. Cassius to skin. Yeah, for sure. And and that's concerning, like based off of what transpires in the next section again like i what i was saying before where it flips back and forth okay like yeah that's funny but we're like in the throes of kind of watching somebody have like a low-key crisis Mm -hmm. yes yeah yeah because the next one i think the only thing to talk about and this will be an ongoing thing it's the only thing left in this chapter is that how i don't know if happy but relieved I would say is the word that Ori is that they have mm-hmm. diabetes. And that's where you're like, even as the reader, kind of understanding of like, okay, so then where do your allegiance lie if you're this relieved that Diomedes is alive? And this that... we see as like the end of the illusion of a romantic relationship between she and Cassius mm-hmm. as well. Yeah. To be fair, I always thought that she had nothing to do with Cassius, but Cassius's feelings, I think, come crashing down on him right now of, like, you really had no chance. You thought maybe you could probably sway her, and now it is the, like, yeah. oh, no, that's where her um, emotions lie. But she's yeah, going to You never had off. your car. She's going to, yeah, like, no, no. But uh, the next chapter is then several describing how oh my god i was driving home today reading that or listening to this and like gagging as he and it was funny because i could feel myself so i've like feet on the pedal i'm on major highway in toronto as she's just or sorry Severo is describing so you skin the toes and then you're gonna salt the toes and you're gonna bash and the most thing like critical um nerves are underneath the cute and i could i'm like driving and i can feel myself like pulling my toes up and like i was like oh like i was getting a like visceral reaction while driving today and it's the third time i've either read or listened to it and i every time i'm like this is so gross and meanwhile so you know in the room cassius Lyria and Ori are all probably having the same reaction to me of like you just feel through your body of like okay I need to feel that my toes are attached right now and Dara's Pierce is over like, here like tell me <laughs> what it's drama. like to torture somebody based off of the toes and by the way FBI agents this is for my book <laughs> right oh my god it yep. gets into that like <laughs> author versus serial killer like yeah yeah but, uh, yeah, and then Darrow is sitting there being like, move on, get over it. <laughs> like, stop trying to get a reaction out of them. Like, what are you doing? We are not doing this. We're not torturing him. Like, absolutely not. Like, so funny. But, yeah, I just, like, can tell you what part of the highway I was when he was describing that. Because immediately my feet were coming off the, like, gas pedal. Because I was like, oh, my God, my, my, my own toes. Oh, God. We're absolutely not torturing him, except psych. 
<laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh. And, um. Yeah. I, um. It, it's like we start. I think it's the start of the next chapter or the next mm -hmm. Darrow chapter. We see that like Darrow is like still very deeply traumatized. Oh yeah, he's having like, nightmares. He's exactly having nightmares about the fucking Askamani coming on the ship yeah. and the banging on the door basically that they've murdering already killed Cassius. all of them. They've killed several. They've and like describes what they've done to each of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And here they are for me. And like wakes up freaking out that that's what it is. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. he's he's going through the PTSD, he's going through the nightmares, he's going through the stress. Um yeah, I mean understandable based on where he is. And then oh, yeah. the banging is real. And it's Lyria freaking out of he's doing it, he's torturing the prisoner. Yeah. Right. The the there's a lot of movement in this section rapidly. Yeah. Uh and a lot is revealed through how people are dealing with the stress of this moment. You know, Darrow obviously can infer that this it sure this is about a certain like Severo enacting a certain what he perceives to be utility or protocol. Yeah. Then we have the interplay between Cassie and Ori, where Darrow tries to deploy Ori as a check against Cassie as rushing in and making things worse. But Ka Ori's far more fo focused on what's happening to Diomedes. Mm -hmm. And uh, and Darrow picks up on that, but Cassius doesn't. But Darrow notices that Cassius doesn't pick up on it. Meanwhile, Lyria is just doing her best to get in there, and ends up at the wrong side of Severo's fist. Well, and we'll get into that. Yeah. In a moment, but mm -hmm. yeah, of you know them rushing the room is a huge thing, and he's trying to. This is where he smells the alpine on Cassius's breath. Yep. And says like yep. you are you being around here is not going to be helpful, and Cassius uses like whatever move to get around Darrow and into the room, and you know it's it's an ongoing like you're antagonizing him. Ori uh, Ori is the first one who ends up injured. Yes, because she, she shoves mm -hmm. and breaks yeah. her finger. If not, like, I guess she looks like she's in pain from the wrist, and then it's later that the finger is what, like... Severo cause... is removing the guy, is removing Diomedes' teeth, teeth, and, and then the electrocuting the exposed Electric nerves. Off. Again, like, nope. Yep. Visceral reaction. Sounds like a lot of fun for a space trip. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then, uh, you know, you get that back and forth of several thinks this is what Daryl wants. You gave me the yeah, look. Yeah, he's like, you gave me the look. This is what I do. This is why you have the goblin. Yeah, this is why you bring me along. That's why you always bring me along. Right, so, you, so we you can love keep the, you clean. Yeah, yeah. It's you sarcasm, this, though. You love the. Don't you think? I, no, I don't I think, think it is. It, I think it. I really think he's. True. I think that's what Severo deeply believes. Yeah, yeah. He's like, you don't, you don't actually care. You just, you like what I do for you. Right. It's like. like yeah, like I get, I like yes, but the way that he's delivering it, he's like, "You say I'm your friend, but this is my utility. Let's be real about it." Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think we're saying the same thing just differently. Just, yeah, because I think from what we know and what we will hear in the next little bit of Severo is going through a crisis. We we know that. Us as the reader knows it is based on, and Daryl will learn in the next little bit, 
he doesn't feel he was there for Victra. So then what place does he have in anyone's life? If he can't be there for his wife, why is his best friend bringing him along? And that's where he then digs deep into, well, Severo's not who Daryl wants. Severo wants the goblin because it's this, it's this self-doubt. It's this crisis of nobody wants Severo. Right. Severo's not a goblin. Yeah. So yeah. Severo fails, right? Like, yeah. And we see this in this moment and it's this, you know, whatever look he thinks Darrow gave him, it is, he was, I think in that moment in his crisis, what would the goblin do and interpret it, what he wanted to see and is now upset that he interpreted that wrong. And Darrow is yes. now pushing back of like, this is not who we are. This is not what we do. Well, this is what you told me to, but it is, there is no word said. So it's that miscommunication based on Severo's reaction because Severo's not in his, he's not in a good mental state at all. He has no therapy in space. He doesn't even have the pass to the veil and he has no one else to talk to. At least at this point, we know that Cassius and Lyria are clearly talking. Whether or not that includes their own trauma, we learn it includes Severo's trauma. So my guess is that they would have a little bit of what each other's going through. I think Cassius, if Darrow wanted to talk about something, he knows that Cassius would be there for him. Or he's keeping everything in her. But Severo has no outlet. And that's where we're seeing he's reduced to violence. And we'll see in a moment him reduced to violence against Cassius, which mirrors back to Morning Star, where it is the fight mm -hmm. of Severo versus Darrow is the only way Severo can get his anger out. Like he is but ultimately, person. we see in this chapter that that violence, that externalized violence, is ultimately just a last ditch effort to keep uh, himself yes. from enacting that upon himself. For sure. Yeah. 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 He has, yeah, he's completely, it's right on the edge of becoming like an actual split personality situation. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we, we thankfully catch it. Darrow catches it right before it becomes an issue. I think Darrow handles it in a very direct approach that brings the situation to a physical space instead of it just being in a mental space, which is pretty wise, I think, of Darrow. I mean, For it can sure. be dangerous. Obviously, I, those kinds of interactions need to be heavily moderated, refereed so that they don't get out of hand, but he's fully aware of that as he's going into it. If fully, and I think he had control until Lyria became a liability, but he goes into, so it's Severo and Cassius take off and are fighting it out and are, it's not just this anger, it is not just, and I love the fact of like, it calls out that Cassius is drunk, but Severo is sober and used to taking down guys bigger than him. So knows how to play mm -hmm. Cassius, but then is reduced to words of calling out Cassius for every terrible thing he's done. And they're going mm -hmm. back and forth, fighting it out. It's hurtful. It's so hurtful. It's so hard to read. Like, you just, you don't like it. And you know how far Cassius has come. But it, it needed to happen. Uh, but I like the whole time Darrow is sitting on a crate. And the moment Lyria walks in, like, he's like, come sit. Just watch. And Leary is the one freaking out. I'm like, what the fuck? And Darrow's like, yeah. Yeah. they're fine. They're grown men. Let them fight. Yeah. Couldn't, couldn't save Julian. Couldn't protect Quinn. Couldn't keep Mustang intrigued. You're the shallow end of the pool. Can't, couldn't save your sovereign because you're a traitor. Then you couldn't join the Republic because you're not welcome whole Ares thing, but the saddest shit is you spent years on the loon brat only to have him ditch you for the world that chewed you up and spat you out at the first opportunity he could get. Yeah. But can't that's... even stand straight without a woman inflating your spine. Yeah, that's fucking vicious. Yeah. But yet, 
it's true, and I think Cassius needs to hear it. Like, mm-hmm. I think oh, yeah. Severa has 100%. every reason to say it, and it is. It is the reason Cassius drinks. Especially that Lysander. We've seen that when Teo brought it up, or when Quick brought it up. The Lysander part weighs heavily on Cassius. And so Cassius needed to hear it, and I think Darrow knew that Cassius needed to hear it. Mm-hmm. But Darrow was missing a piece of this whole thing, which is when Cassius responds with, you couldn't even be there for your wife. And mm-hmm. that's then when Lyria, because Lyria knows she's in shit, she gave Cassius that ammo, gets up and yep. is the person who should, like, Darrow didn't think she would, didn't think she'd get involved figured she'd sit there beside and so her getting injured is what brings it all to an end um you know you think that and kind of you've you've skirted around it a couple of times in what you've said skipper you think that Severo's the one that is the most injured party here but like Historically speaking, the only one of the three of the men in this context that have even begun to contend with the decisions that they've made is Dara. Yeah. Like, Cassius has kind of been like, well, I'll just change what I was doing, and then I'll just be loved and accepted, and it will be fine, and I will just find that love and acceptance through a relationship, and it'll be fine. It's all fine, right? Yeah. And... Yeah. <laughs> like because healthy, it healthy to do. Yeah, yeah, he doesn't have a therapist, so like, just get him, get a girlfriend to do it for you. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. Trickle down therapy. Um. So next we have Severo, who's like, you know, we think that it's Severo who's going to be this big, you know, and Severo is in a crisis. Okay, but it's still, I think, so interesting to see how. Okay, you just spelled out all of Cassius' shit for us. Like, we've all known this, but, like, we've just been like, oh, he's the drunk guy. He's just figuring... He's a good-natured drunk guy. We love him. But no, he actually has, like, a lot of actually very serious shit that he needs to deal with as well. Yeah. For sure. But I don't think... Like, it's interesting that I don't know if Savro reflects enough on other people. Like, there's those people who go... I'm in crisis, no one else can be in crisis. And the people who acknowledge of like, yes, I'm going through something terrible, other people are going through something terrible. And I think that's it. Right. Severo doesn't actually acknowledge that loss of a child is huge. Everything Severo has gone through is huge. But he does not acknowledge that anybody else can be hurting at this time. And using what Cassius is going through. And I think acknowledges of like, yeah, fine, you're drunk because of these reasons. But doesn't actually dive deep into that. And we see after that Darrow spells it out for him. Of like, okay, Cassius killed your dad. How We killed his entire family. We did this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Julian died at my hand because of the rules of the Institute. Doesn't stop the hurt of losing your twin. Mm -hmm. Lyria's here. She lost her entire family. Or, like, he actually goes down the list of all of the the people that are, like, there and spells out their specific relationship to how they move together as a team and as a team specifically for the sake of the Republic and, and what they're trying to do. And I thought that that was like a, okay, that shows Darrow's growth. Yeah. Very, very well that he's able to see and empathize with each of their situations. And, and, and Severo is really still has not, I, I mean, talk about, I mean, no shade. But, like, he's over here calling out Cassius for using a woman to prop him up. I mean, I like to think that he had some major growth in Golden Sun and Morningstar. But, like, ultimately he he got with a woman that provided him, like, a great sense of value with Victra. And he has not done the work to heal his sense of internalized worthlessness. 
which is what why we're here. For sure. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and it unfortunately takes Lyria getting injured, getting and and it's Cassius that hurts her that in that moment I don't think it's just because it's Lyria. I like to think that Cassius would in that moment react to anyone being injured. But it's this panic on him of like, what the fuck have I done? Mm -hmm. Like she's Mm -hmm. immediately snoring before she hits the ground and her entire face is smashed in because she's so small in comparison to these men. And Severo is pushed into the boxes and hanging out there and knows at that point of like, we've gone too far. We've taken this too far. Uh, and is kind of sitting in his own thing. But then you, that's when Darrow says like, what am I missing? What, what was he saying about Victor? And I think the hurt of several believing that Victor was on the call and didn't want to talk to him. Mm-hmm. And like, Yep. That anxiety of my wife is avoiding me and like it's not spelled out. And it's funny because I do remember someone in the den saying, uh, thinking that Victor was there. And I don't think she was. I don't think that is Victor's move. I think Victor truly could not communicate with him. But he truly believes that she's avoiding him because he wasn't there. Uh, yeah. And the hurt that comes from that. And Darrow, unfortunately, being the last person to learn, but then is able to take that and be like, hey, I love you. I love your wife. I love your kids more than anything in the world. And I, mm-hmm. I you know, going through the goblin versus Severo, which I think is an ongoing theme in all of this of Mustang versus Virginia, Reaper versus Darrow goblin versus several like it's a big all of them having two personalities adrius versus uh jackal um atlas versus the allfather fa versus wagner yes so like they're ephraim versus the front that he presents yeah like a lot of them have multiple faces that they wear very Mm -hmm. purposefully Carlson, what were you going to say? Oh, I was going to say Adrius, I think, is the only one that doesn't fit that. He's very much oh, so like... He's taken on the jackal as his full life, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, that's... Oh, I don't know. I feel like Adrius bears a lot of daddy issue wounds. And, like, I, I viewed him in the first books as pretty sympathetic, especially towards the end. Yeah. He, he felt very... Now, I don't know about Abomin Adrius... Dunno. Yeah. I, I felt differently yeah, I don't know. about Adrius. Like, Adrius. Yeah. I mean, like, yes, he would he definitely had his his daddy issues. But like he he definitely leaned more into the the jackal, right? Mm-hmm. Where like my yeah. how does my greatest enemy know me than know me better than any of my friends like i've never been given anything of my own like i've got this this jackal scepter yeah um it's almost like like, a, like adrius willingly chose the jackal whereas all these other people uh were forced into <laughs> their <laughs> other role yeah mm-hmm. okay tracking no. interesting i mean like it, he definitely one. does have the two sides yeah, but for sure I would say, though, Mustang is the interesting one that being Mustang is, I would say, the wife and mother. Being Virginia is the one forced, quote unquote, forced into that role. It is the job to be Virginia. It is the family yeah. life that is Mustang. She is the one that reverses it. The rest of them, mm-hmm. Darrow yeah. is the friend and father. Reaper is the warlord. Mm-hmm. Severo yeah. is the friend and father. Goblin is this thing of nightmares. <laughs> Badger is the is the arch imperator Gray. 
normie name, which shall not be used yeah. here, is the mother. <laughs> yeah. I, what, about, I, what about you guys? I have, we, have we all diverged? Yeah. I think so. Like, yeah, I pretty think much. When I am being skipper, I am, like, you see me in the den, I am there, I am turned on, whatever. But when I am normie name, I actually have a lot of social anxiety and normally would not put myself, like, this would be being like, oh, I'm taking up too much space. But as Skipper, I can use my voice. I can talk. I can do whatever. Like, Skipper is, like, Normie name would not have done at HowlerCon how I did. I would mm -hmm. have had so many more drawbacks. But Skipper could be the one who was standing on chairs and yelling and doing all of that. So 100%, there is kind of a, I, I think anyone who gets into these, roles and a lot of people online will see that of who you are online versus in real life and you know who you are at your job versus real life like pierce got to meet normie name at work where i had to be a professional and i had to do this and then the next night i'm the next night i think at that point was still normie name because i was with jabs who was not yet in the den so and not we yet were, jabs was not yet jabs so we were normie name but like social normie name and then he got to see skipper who was this like i don't know i would never have worn a shirt with that many holes in it with pants with that many holes in it as normie name that was a total, true skipper thing so 100 percent, i think everyone when you end up with these you know and it doesn't have to be a name change but work versus home Right? Like, it's a total change, but our characters in this are two different dichotomies. Crescent, mm -hmm. I've seen you as normie name, where I had to be like, who the fuck is that the whole time? Do your feel? work people know that you're in a nerdy book club? Are you one of the, the other guys? Me? Cause, yeah, because you're, yeah. I think there's a subset yes, of they, guys. Some, okay. some of them know. Okay. Because, Actually, like, TR. None of his guy friends. Oh, I think he might have just got, I think he just got outed by his fiance. But up until like last week, none of his like guy friends that he goes plays basketball with or whatever, like they know. And I know like yeah. <laughs> Taylor's friends don't know that he is in a nerdy book club. And I'm curious about like how many other. Oh, yeah. No, most, Crescent, most of my friends, friends are in the den. We yeah, that's true. Really like, that's true. A lot of my very, very good friends are in the den. Carol. Um, uh, yeah, they're all in the den. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know. I I don't think I'm that different as Crescent versus Normie name. Yeah. I don't think I am that different either, but there are mantles within, like, there are things within that come into ascendancy in the den. And I yeah. think that's mm -hmm. probably, I mean, that's kind of true of, like, Mustang, too. Mustang is never fully not herself. Right. But there are yeah. things that get ramped up in certain roles. For sure. And that's me as well. Like, that's, you know, I'm always dying to be the center of attention. But in the den, I take that center of attention versus in the rest of my life, I take mm -hmm. a step back. Um, yeah, which is a, and now in, in interesting how many people I've met from the den in real life in, like, going to visit Crescent of, like, retracting into myself of like how much am i talking and taking up space or like a few other people that i now know and in, in more integral in their life of like where does this like you know skipper where does normie name fit into this which is always an interesting <laughs> thing but i think getting back to several um before we have to talk call my therapist on all of this uh <laughs> <laughs> bring her on get her on the group call Wait, where's, where's, um, Stinger? Stinger, get in here, Stinger. Um, my therapist's husband has read Red Rising, so we're just waiting for her to read it. Uh, but back to Severo, I think people who have any work-life balance, but especially in these capacities where work is as intense and you're expected to be a certain thing, like, it makes sense that he can pull those two pieces apart. The problem is that he's losing his original self 
Mm-hmm. And he doesn't think Severo is needed. I mean, he, when's the last time he was home, too? I mean, he hasn't had a touchstone yeah. outside of other men who have uh, put similar the yeah. rising and the war effort up top above everything else, you know? Sure. Yeah, it's a hard, hard read. But he needs to hear it. He Cassius needs to hear what was said, and and Severo needs to hear what was said. Darrow I... has to work through his problems that he doesn't really have anything for someone to shove down his throat at the moment. He'll just go, yeah, I know, I'm working on it. <laughs> yeah, drowning man is what Severo calls him. Yeah. Um, I recognize this... <laughs> tendency in an argument with a person that you're really intimate with like you're holding back you're holding back and then somebody throws out like what you feel is like the the below the belt thing and then the counter is like the nuclear option yeah which was cassius's play here oh yeah yep yep for sure but also like I get why Lyria told Cassius, but also like Lyria, don't yep. be that person. Well, and like she instantly, she knows she fucked up too. Yeah. Oh, and that's where she ends up getting involved and then injured because she's like, "Dear God, yeah. he stepped over the line." It's like Lyria. There's one thing. About, yeah, that like, did not feel good. Yeah. Like I get it. You want to tell your best friend everything, but when your best friend is currently at you know, at odds with somebody, you don't give them that tea. Like, you're all stuck on a ship together. How do you think this is going to work out? <laughs> yeah, that's a really good point. Bad ship etiquette, Lyria. Like, yeah. I always work under the assumption that everything I say will be said to whoever it is, a significant other and their best friend. So if I tell Crescent anything, I assume at all times, the tower's going to find out, <laughs> Carol's going <laughs> to find out, and Mrs. Crescent's going to find out. Like, that's just how I operate. But then what those people do with that information, like, I don't know. It's uncontrollable. It's yeah. uncontrollable. Yeah, exactly. Like and like, I don't know, what is Tower? I've met, Ta I've met Mrs. Tower. I don't think Mrs. Tower is going to do anything, but... You have to look at it of like, Lyria, you have that information. Yeah, you want to tell your bestie. What is the bestie going to do with that information? And yeah. giving it to Cassius, who is at odds with several. It's a bad mood. But I also and is ultimately she wants to talk about her trauma, and that's part of her yeah. trauma. Yeah. Yeah. It happened to her. Her her justification is probably like, this happened to me. Yeah. Yeah. Slippery slope. Yeah. But, yeah, you always got to operate that everybody is also telling their significant other and best friends. And that's how the whole world learns gossip, guys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I can't figure out why nobody knows who Banksy is. As. Clearly somebody out there knows. Clearly somebody. I had this discussion with somebody earlier this week who's why that's in my frame of mind. There's no way nobody knows who Banksy is. As. Um... But yeah. But uh, yeah, and then, you know, we end with Cassius, or yeah, Cassius running Lyria to the Mad Bay. Yeah. No, we, we end with. Oh, we end with the. Darrow and Darryl Severo's, Severo's conversation. conversation. Yeah. Basically, <laughs> keeping Severo from Basically. stepping out of an airlock. Well, yeah, offering it to him and then, and then, and then pulling like, it back. Value. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and so they are headed to Sungrave, which we know is almost certain death, basically. But the, the heart of that, raw power. The fact that we oh, don't die immediately might is. change that. Uh, we get that Darrow is. quote in there too about the prisoner holding his own key, yeah. which is there's several philosophical. Uh, callbacks to that. I can't remember the specific except that, but I know that I have like an Eastern philosophy 
that tracks with certain concepts. And I want to say that even in like, uh, like Western philosophy, like European philosophy, there's a couple of different people that touch and like Greek philosophers. I feel like that's at least been touched on progressively from East to West (laughs) in philosophy over the ages of the prisoner holding his own key. But I thought that was a good way of calling out what's going on, especially as somebody who has himself been the willing participant of his own uh, lack of growth in the past. Yep. For sure. He does know best because he did finally decide to move beyond that point. Yeah. Is that right. that? That's for that. this one. Anyone that's, else? That's it. Any comments? Concerns? Questions? I have nope. I have concerns, but they're yeah. spoilers. You can't hear them yet. <laughs> uh, well, we're back next week where this drops off. I guess we're heading to Sungrave. Thank you, Badger, for joining us. We don't get you again for Lightbringer, do we? No, but I will find something yeah. to talk about and I'll sign up on the sheet. <laughs> Perfect. Love it. Perfect. It's just fill in like it. I think it's like unlimited entries. Just like in the middle of the night, be like, ah, oh, this and like throw it in there. It'll be like, great. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> now that this one's out of my brain cache, yeah. I will be co- cogitating on what could come next. So sure. and that expect is- me. Oh, Ooh, nice. I still need to expect me tattoo. Let's be serious. Solid references all Uh, around. Yeah. Everyone else listening, uh, join the den, sign up for the episodes between Lightbringer and Dark Age or Dark Age. Yes. We're going back. Lightbringer and Red God. Thank you very much. Um, Or past Red God, you know, throw it in there and we'll plan for 2026. It'll be fine. Uh, Thank you, Badger, as always, for joining us. Thank you, everybody, for listening and watching. It's been great. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. Tell us if the thing lights up. Does it light up when we say like and subscribe? Oh, yeah. Now you're not getting the thumbs up. No, it's not Oh, now it's broken. Now we've broken it. No more like And I never actually was giving a thumbs up. I was only just kind of having a thumb available. There it goes. There it is. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) <laughs> cracked it perfect you can't do a solid thumbs up you have to do a like a solid. sliding sliding thumb I like sliding it. thumb All no right. okay whatever have a good night everybody inconsistent at best yeah bye y'all beta bye. beta testing thanks for listening to fade to obsidian where skipper and crescent casually dissect the friendships relationships and those fade to black moments in the red rising saga If you enjoy our chaos, please remember to like and subscribe on whatever platform you listen to podcasts. We are available on YouTube, Spotify, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts. Don't forget to give us a follow on Instagram at fade to obsidian And if you'd like behind-the-scenes content or to be involved firsthand in our chaotic decisions, subscribe to our Patreon for as little as $2 a month. For $5, you'll receive a monthly postcard from Crescent. Will it be one of the ones that we accidentally stole from Tulsa? I'm so sorry to Copperless. And if you're crazy enough to trust Skipper with maybe sending you a postcard, our third tier is $100 a month. But please don't choose this option. Lastly, make sure to join the pack in the Howler's Den on Discord, discord.gg slash the Howler's Den, where we talk all things Red Rising. Until next time, Omnisphere Lupus.